Good day, everyone. I'm Neil Love from Research to Practice, and welcome to Striving for Consensus. It's the day we talk about the current and future management of metastatic non-small cell lung cancer in patients who progress uh, after having received a checkpoint inhibitor. We have a great faculty today, Dr. Corey Langer from the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia, Dr. Tiziana Leo from the Emory University in Atlanta, Dr. Karen Recamp from the Cedars-Sinai Cancer uh, and, uh, in Los Angeles, and Dr. Jacob Sands from the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. Here's where we're heading today. We're gonna to start out with a little bit of a warm-up discussion. Then we're gonna jump into some cases from the faculty. And then we're gonna go through, each of the faculty is gonna do a presentation on this topic. We'll go through their presentations. And then we're gonna finish up with some additional uh, case histories. But I just wanna start out with a little bit of uh, background. And Jacob, you know, the topic here is uh, managing people who progressed on IOs. And we're gonna get into your vision about why people do progress on IOs. But I just thought we could start out with um, maybe a little bit of a snippet from your own practice, Jacob, in terms of who are the patients with metastatic non-small cell who don't get an, uh, a checkpoint inhibitor up front. The two big categories that you hear a lot about are people with prior autoimmune conditions or transplants who really are not good candidates for IOs, and also people who are getting targeted therapy. So you can, uh, Jacob, can you provide a little bit more insight into your practice in terms of, again, what are the situations where you're not using an IO up front? Yeah, this is such an important topic, and I'll just start with pointing out how miraculous these IOs have been for a subset of patients that I firmly believe that in the next 10 years we'll be able to have more data that says there are in fact some patients actually cured from what has been an incurable diagnosis by the inclusion of these. And that's an important first thing to acknowledge because then to not give it is obviously a big deal. Now, you pointed out the classic population, those who have had a transplant, the transplant failure rate is very high. Uh, and so, of course, that is really, I think, a hard line in not uh, utilizing. Um, and autoimmune diseases. Now, initially, it was really kind of all autoimmune diseases, although we've been able to back down a bit from that. I'd say someone who has uh, really symptomatic autoimmune disease and is on active management of that, I, I tend to not give checkpoint inhibitors for. But a history of um, controlled, not particularly symptomatic, not requiring active management, you know, some of these patients can get a checkpoint inhibitor. And uh, I, I often involve their rheumatologist within that discussion. If, in fact, they have a rheumatologist, if they don't have a rheumatologist, uh, th then usually that's pretty suggestive of them not having very severe autoimmune disease, although really that needs to, that needs to be dived into in, in more detail. So, Karen, maybe you can uh, add some comments to what uh, Jacob uh, brought up, but also the issue of people uh, who have uh, targetable mutations. And, you know, I think of, in terms of EGFR and ALK, I mean, it's pretty clear everybody's going to start out with targeted therapy. Whether they're even going to get an IIO, IO, we could talk about. But, of course, there are so many other targetable mutations. How do you decide whether you're going to use an IO up front, uh, particularly people who have potentially targetable lesions? So I think you're right, targetable lesions, um, there's some differences that we look at. And I usually think about it mainly as um, kind of smoking-related targetable alterations versus non-smoking-related targetable alterations. So when we think about um, EGFR, ALK, and ROS1, I put RET into that also, and NTREC, uh, which is exceedingly rare. Um, but those are patients where I'm thinking they, we, we know from the second line data that um, generally monotherapy, immunotherapy is about a 5% uh, response rate or less for these patients. We're getting some indications that in EGFR patients, adding immunotherapy to chemotherapy may not be beneficial. So um, immunotherapy in these patients, I think, is less of an exciting um, uh, treatment at this moment in time until we can uh, figure out how best to use um, immunotherapeutics in these patients. And so I would definitely choose the frontline um, targeted therapies for these patients. And then there's a unique um, aspect of, especially of osimertinib, where we know that patients who receive immunotherapy may have higher um, risk of even grade three toxicities, um, especially um, uh, 
interstitial lung disease. So we want to avoid toxicities um, and otherwise we may lose a, a, a very good drug like osimertinib if we um, give immunotherapy first. So it's about toxicity and the lack of eff efficacy. When we think about KRAS, and BRAF, I think those are a little bit different and I think there's more discussion and obviously treating KRAS is a second line treatment anyway. So those patients generally will receive immunotherapy up front. And then MET I think is a big outlier. Some patients um, may respond and other patients may not, but I tend to use targeted therapy in those patients first. So Corey, you know, it's really amazing. They're gonna spend three hours talking about this topic, which kind of really didn't exist 10 years ago. Uh, there's a, a little video that circulates on the internet, it was about seven years ago, of me at a GU conference saying, I think things are about to change because I knew that the uh, NEVA was up for approval in the FDA. That was only like seven or eight years ago. And on that video I go, things are about to change. Your infusion rooms are going to be looking a lot different. Any thoughts about this revolution that has occurred, Corey? And also, again, any other thoughts about the, this issue of who doesn't get an IO up front? I agree with both Jacob and Karen. This uh, immunotherapy has irrevocably altered our therapeutic landscape. We're, you know, we see long-term survivors now um, out four, five, six, seven, eight, in my case, at least a couple people, nine years and beyond. Uh, many of whom were originally on the phase uh, one and two studies or the second line trials. This is unprecedented. Uh, Non-small cell, at least in our youth, uh, was not like this at all. Um, I worry that we may have reached a plateau and hopefully we can um, ease above that. And certainly the topic of discussion today will hopefully give us uh, pointers in those directions. Uh, to expand on the uh, patients uh, who are appropriate or not appropriate, uh, one caveat that needs to be uh, mentioned, uh, all patients, uh, I would say all uh, patients with adenocarcinoma, regardless of smoking history, and certainly all never or remote former smokers, regardless of histology, need to have their molecular workup done before initiating immunotherapy. Uh, I agree with Karen. Uh, you start uh, immunotherapy on a patient who uh, may have a high PDL1, but you have not uh, completely classified their uh, um, molecular phenotype you'll do them a tremendous disservice that they do turn out to have ALK or uh, EGFR. So whether it's uh, liquid testing or tissue or ideally both, uh, that needs to be accomplished a priori. And it's frustrating because it, the turnaround for NGS is still exceedingly long, which is another issue we didn't deal with 10 or 15 years ago when we empirically started everybody on the same regimen. As far as the patients who should not get immunotherapy, I think we've gotten a bit more liberal over time. Certainly uh, an individual with a past history of Crohn's that's no longer active, while they might have been excluded from clinical trials, I would uh, definitely uh, treat that individual. Patients with a history of hepatitis or HIV that's now controlled with appropriate medication and have appropriate uh, T cell counts, I would uh, consider strongly that population. That may not be a consensus, but I think uh, there are data now showing that uh, it is relatively safe. I do draw the line, as uh, Jacob said, at active immune, uh, uh, collagen and vascular disease that's requiring ongoing treatment. And whether or not a rheumatologist is involved in their care, I think is a, a, a good uh, checkpoint uh, as to whether uh, that patient should uh, get treated. When it comes to transplants, um, I, drew the, I draw the line of cardiac and liver transplants. You can't go to the store and get a new liver or uh, heart. However, kidney transplants, I have started giving that because you can always go back to dialysis. Uh, and there are regimens that are compatible with that. So it's a gamble, but if you're really uh, out of options or if that looks to be the best option, I think a, a, a shared decision-making discussion in that uh, uh, venue is reasonable. We had a famous uh, case uh, presented, I remember it was the beginning of the pandemic of a patient with multiple sclerosis, metastatic disease, you know, they didn't want to give her a checkpoint inhibitor, she's running out of options, very intelligent patient, went for a second opinion, uh, wasn't fulminant multiple sclerosis, I think it was actually not even being treated at that point, they decided to go ahead and give her a checkpoint inhibitor. She had a complete response and is doing great. Not saying that, you know, whether it was a good decision or a bad decision, but the, the thing I always love about the case was that the PD-1 level was zero. 
Anyhow, just to finish this out, uh, Tiziana, I'm curious about your thoughts. It's interesting, Corey brought up a really important point that we've been talking about a lot, which is this patient who's sick and needs to be uh, treated right away. They're in the ICU. They might be in uh, respiratory failure. And the, this issue that Corey brought up of holding off on giving the I.O. until you make sure that you have uh, your NGS or whatever you're going to get for, to look for targetable lesions. Any thoughts, uh, Tiziana, about patients in your practice who aren't getting uh, checkpoint inhibitors up front? Yeah, so I agree with everything that's been said so far, and I think regarding the ICU patient, that's an extremely challenging case, but I feel like that's the case where NGS is really of the utmost importance because that's the treatment that has the quickest time to respond. So I think the role of liquid biopsy and getting faster turnaround times for our NGS results is essential in that patient with a critical need, and those are the patients that I am seen coming out of the ICU. They have a targetable mutation. You can initiate with um, targeted therapy and hopefully then those patients are the ones that turn around the quickest. IO doesn't turn around that quick. So I think still getting NGS, liquid and tissue essential up front. Um, whether these patients um, receive IO inside that hospital admission, that's extremely rare, not only because of you know cost and ability to give those patients IO in the inpatient setting? And again, will they benefit quick enough? I don't think so. So I think, again, for those patients, we really have to individualize care. And once we can hopefully stabilize them, get them to the right treatment, and if that is IO or IO combinations, we do that as quickly as possible. One thing that I think is increasingly a challenge in terms of the patient that is being treated up front, I would say are the patients that have recurrence. And so these are now metastatic um, setting, but that I've received I.O. and increasingly we're using the neoadjuvant strategy with chemo I.O. Um, and so identifying which, which patients are going to be benefiting from standard of care I.O. I.O. combinations, I think is also another challenge. And obviously, you know, those patients that are chemo rads and have progression under value map. So adding another sort of challenge in terms of IO resistance or who's still IO sensitive up front in the recurrent setting with metastatic disease is something that we're also learning more about. You know, that last point was so important. All right, well, that was uh, very interesting. Well, let's move on now and talk about some uh, real life cases. Uh, we ask you to present uh, cases that are re relevant to the scenario that we're talking about today and also a little bit about the patient and what it was like to take care of this particular person. Uh, so Jacob, can you tell us a little bit about your 69-year-old man? Yeah, so this is a, a guy uh, who was healthy, active, uh, working as a lawyer uh, at a high level, uh, also doing uh, like a whiskey club on Fridays with his friends, uh, just a real character. Uh, but suddenly was having some shortness of breath that really worsened over months, uh, as often happens, initially treated as a pneumonia, had a little bit of improvement, but then, you know, no resolution. And then as symptoms worsened, his, uh, his wife ended up just bringing him down to the uh, emergency room downtown. He was admitted to the hospital for a workup. Uh, you can see on the right there, his CAT scans showed uh, pleural effusion, pericardial effusion, and really just, you know, uh, findings throughout both lungs. Uh, some of the fluid was, was drained and, and unfortunately did end up showing a lung adenocarcinoma. Uh, it had no actionable alterations, PDL1 was 20%. He did, I'll point out, have a smoking history. Um, it was uh, somewhat moderate, um, so uh, ha had kind of transitioned to pipes, uh, so wasn't really smoking multiple packs per day, but kind of uh, an occasional pipe, although with a prior smoking history. Now, as you can see, uh, the picture on the right there, I learned about this guy from him. Uh, so he was uh, on, he did go on our clinical trial with Datapotamab direct scan, and in his case, he did lose his hair. And when he did, he pointed out that now he looks like Kojak, uh, who, as I said, I had to look <laughs> up. But he would walk around with a, a lollipop and sunglasses just to really bring it home. But he, so, you know, I saw him in the hospital, and relative to our, our prior discussion around checkpoint inhibitors, he was extremely anxious 
curious about his diagnosis, understandably, of course. And uh, I find one of the uh, most challenging aspects of being a medical oncologist is to really get a sense of where the patient is coming from psychologically to guide them in their expectations around their treatment and such uh, in an individualized way. Um, and in his case, you know, we talked a lot about starting chemotherapy. Uh, this was in the inpatient setting, getting cycle one inpatient, and then adding in pembrolizumab uh, with a second line as an outpatient. And in his case, really in most cases, I do talk about the uh, potential for very long-term disease control for years with a checkpoint inhibitor. I'll just point out as an aside, I think that you know, within medical oncology, we there, there tends to be um, a discussion about worst case scenario with patients. Uh, but I, I find that when patients come in, um, they don't seem as aware of possible best case scenarios. And so that, that is something I think that's important to round out that conversation. And I, th I think in some ways there's this idea out there that well, if patients understand the worst case possibilities and then things go dramatically better, that then they'll be happy because it's better. And I don't know that I entirely agree with that. I think sometimes people just clench up so much and then they live their lives in such a tense state, uh, not being aware of the real great uh, potential outcomes that, that can happen. And so in his case, you know, we, we talked quite a bit about best possible case scenarios. Of course, I stress that there is no promise here that this is a subset of individuals that really have this, but, but it's possible. Now, in his case, he did get 10 months of disease control, really continued his, his practice of law, uh, continued teaching law students as well, uh, was active, would still have his whiskey clubs, uh, and then had progression 10 months in. And so um, he was really cruising along, I think, uh, doing quite well. And then, of course, at progression, that was another really a, a big event for him, understandably so. And, and, and again, the room's spinning around him as we're trying to then discuss next line therapy. I'll admit that um, now that the checkpoint inhibitors have gone into the first line, having gotten used to having this second line option that has potential amazing outcome benefits uh, with little side effect profile, to now go back to having dose ataxel as a second line therapy is a different experience. Uh, patients uh, end up with quite a bit of toxicity. Um, the benefits of it, uh, although I'd say are real, and of course, absolutely uh, um, a preference to use it rather than not in the majority of patients with a good functional status, uh, it's not an exciting option. And so he was uh, enrolled actually on the, on the phase one, so early within the uh, DS-1062, now called datapotamab deruxtecan trial as second line therapy. He tolerated it extremely well. Uh, as you can see, he, he did lose his hair. Um, he also ended up having some of the eye toxicity. So he'd have some irritation to his eyes and, and, and being the character that he was, he really would not, um, didn't like using eye drops. He just had a real aversion to it to the point where it, it was actually quite difficult for him to really force himself to do it. So he frankly just didn't until I told him, hey, if your eyes get any worse on your ophthalmology exams, you might actually not qualify uh, for continuing therapy on trial. And, and that was what made him then use the eye drops consistently, which worked well for him. Uh, it, this controlled his disease really for... Um, uh, for 21 months uh, with ongoing disease control with uh, datapotamab deruxtecan. Unfortunately, at progression, we, de we then did uh, use docetaxel, uh, and then when he had progression on that, uh, used gemcitabine. And unfortunately, neither of those really did a lot for him. So ultimately, he, uh, he did pass, but uh, was really uh, an absolutely beloved individual within our institute. And, um, and, and he and his family were very grateful for those 21 months uh, on trial, although obviously it's still not enough. And so ongoing research continues to be very important. So one of the themes I'd like to get into with your cases is, you know, what, what value do you think was provided to the patient and family by the treatment that was given? You know, they're, uh, I'm trying to find the time at which you hold off on treatment is a real challenge. And uh, when you look back on this man's uh, course, uh, first of all, I'm curious uh, what you think the value of the therapies were. Also curious how he did on the dato. Did he have any uh, tolerability issues, any mucositis? 
No mucositis, uh, really just the, the loss of hair, which for him was, uh, you know, not distressing for some individuals. It really is. I, I think that's a toxicity that sometimes we, we don't uh, fully appreciate how meaningful that is for patients, but for him it was fine. Um, and then the eye uh, toxicity, which was really mostly found within the ophthalmology exams. He did have some irritation, although it wasn't really impactful to his to his life in any real way. So, uh, you know, on the therapy, I'd say he he is one of the great success stories uh, with the drug, uh, getting 21 months of disease control with ongoing working with his profession uh, and continuing to live a very good quality of life. So we know, I think I saw a press release that says that the, there's gonna be a positive uh, phase three uh, trial of data presented, I'm guessing it's probably going to be at ESMO and Karen, it could be that, you know, in the near future, this next year, uh, this antibody drug conjugate may be coming in uh, to practice as second line therapy. I'm curious what you're thinking, how this is going to affect quality of life, for example, compared to what you're currently using, whether it's docetaxel, docetaxel, or, or or something else. Any thoughts, Karen, about how, what's going to happen if and when uh, these ADCs start coming into practice for lung cancer. So I, I, I agree, this is an exciting time and the ADCs are definitely the area where we are looking to provide you know, better therapies for our patients, especially in this uh, second line and subsequent line therapy. With the data that uh, we have as a press release that we know there's an improvement in progression-free survival over docetaxel, I think we it will be interesting to see the data and look at the toxicity and um, and tolerability of these agents because um, we know that they have a unique um, spectrum of toxicities and adverse events that occur that are not just based on the um, cytotoxic that's used, not just based on the antibody, but, a, but multiple contributing factors from the ADCs. So I like to see that we're getting improvement in progression-free survival, which is definitely meaningful for patients as we see with uh, Dr. Sand's patient. Um, but I think we need to start to understand the toxicity and uh, we're really looking forward to seeing those results presented so that we can start to understand those and compare those. But we we all want something better than docetaxel. So, uh, Tiziana, I'm curious about your thoughts on this. I feel like every time we do a program now on solid tumors, we're talking about ADCs. You know, bladder cancer has two approved ADCs in the metastatic setting, and one of them has now just moved up into the first line setting. One of the issues that comes up with these, uh, Tiziana, you know, they are targeted therapies, but more and more, and of course you've had TDXD for her two mutant lung cancer, so now you're starting to see this, that you still do often see uh, chemotherapy-like side effects, certainly with TDXD. I'm not sure to what extent you see that with DATO. Again, any thoughts, Tiziana, about how you see these uh, antibody drug conjugates fitting in, and what kinds of chemo-like GI effects, cytopenes, et cetera, uh, can we see in this situation? I think, you know, the ADCs are for sure exciting in development therapeutic strategies across the board for all solid tumors, and we have that study here at Emory as well, and we're treating patients with solid tumors, including small cell lung cancer. Um, as we think about second line and beyond, this is a population of high unmet need. So having patients on trial and second line is sort of very exciting to patients. They want to be a part of having a novel strategy and a lot of our patients also want to contribute and help others as well. So with data DXD specifically, um, I think the overall strategy with showing improved progression-free survival in the Tropion Lung Zero One study, I agree, we gotta see the data and see what kind of magnitude of benefit we're seeing in terms of progression-free survival and then this is a dual primary endpoint, so we're still holding out for overall survival as well. Depending on that magnitude of that benefit and comparison in terms of toxicities. So having patient-related outcomes and quality of life outcomes in these studies to compare the differential toxicities, I think will be very important. We all know the side effect profile of docetaxel, but we're also very accustomed to managing the side effect profile of docetaxel. And now we have a new agent, which does have GI toxicities, the mucositis that you mentioned, um, the eye toxicities, myelosuppression is also seen. So I think we're gonna also have to learn how to manage these side effects more proactively, how to educate patients about 
managing these side effects. As Jacob was saying, it was really hard for this patient to really get on board with managing the ocular toxicities. So I think we have to factor that in as well, depending on you know the patient's perspective on these therapies. So a final comment from Corey. You know, I was just thinking, I'm not sure how many people even know who Kojak was. But <laughs> when, when, I saw, when I saw that picture, I was flashing on, you know, when I first started doing videos in the mid-1980s at the University of Miami, one of the first patients, I started interviewing patients. And one of the first patients I interviewed was a Miami policeman who uh, sat there during the entire, of course, this was a while back, sat there during the entire interview with me with metastatic disease, smoking, literally smoking during the interview. Anyhow, in those days you could do it indoors. But it also brings up the issue, uh, Corey, of how these patients affect us. I think you could hear in Jacob's voice the feeling he had about this man. I can you know, imagine he's, he's dealing with metastatic disease and he's, he's bringing humor into the situation. So in addition to your thoughts about the case, I'm curious also about your thoughts about you know, how patients affect us and how we learn from them. It's, it's really uh, uh, a heady time for uh, patients, but particularly for us, we're suddenly parachuting into the lives of people we've never known at a point that is most critical in their lives. Uh, uh, on a crash course basis, getting to know them and usually their families. And, uh, you know, if a family was dysfunctional beforehand, they become twice as dysfunctional if, uh, when confronted with a cancer diagnosis. So in addition to being clinicians and oncologists, we often become family therapists and social workers. We really, it's imperative, and I'm sure this happened with you, Jacob, that um, you enlist the support of other team members. You can't do this alone. It would absolutely completely discombobulate us. Uh, we'd be uh, uh, exhausted uh, both mentally and uh, emotionally. Uh, so I, if patients are having trouble, or if the caregivers are having trouble, I, I make sure they get counseling. I make sure they're introduced to our entire care team, including our uh, advanced practice nurses or uh, nurse practitioners and PAs, uh, that they know who the patient navigator is. Communication is key. Uh, and then, unfortunately, when they die, it's as if the curtain comes down and we're suddenly dissociated from it all. I do maintain contact with some patients, uh, family members afterwards, but that's pretty rare. Um, it's a hard time for them. And I think um, many uh, family members sort of view this experience uh, uh, negatively. They wanna get as far away from uh, the problems that they encountered as they can. Um, but it is uh, it's life altering and in many ways life altering for us. And if we don't learn how to compartmentalize our own lives, uh, it can absolutely drag us under. As far as this specific patient, I'm impressed that his response to the ADC was tw more than twice as long as his original response to uh, Keynote 189. And I echo Tiziana's concerns. Uh, uh, the chemo, the typical chemo toxicities, we have lots of training. We know how to deal with this. We know how to manage myelosuppression. Uh, we can get inventive about managing mucositis. Uh, uh, nausea and vomiting is not a big deal for us. We're qu uh, quite flexible in uh, agents that we can introduce. ILD for me is the big concern. Um, if the patient gets severe ILD, uh, it can be a game changer, can be fatal. So this is a toxicity we really uh, need to know more about, how to uh, manage it successfully, ideally how to prevent it. I don't know if there's much work yet in that regard, but certainly that's an unmet need. Um, I think it's the thing that frightens us the most. And certainly uh, with the trastuzumab deruxtecan, we've seen ILD rates of any grade of 20, 25%, grade three, eight, 10% or higher. Uh, and yet it's an amazing drug that uh, works uh, in mutations where other drugs haven't. Uh, my final point, and this goes to um, the, uh, the question we always get, how long have I got? We don't know the, I always uh, answer that with, I have no idea. I can quote your numbers, but I always tell them, as uh, Jacob has pointed out, both worst and best case scenarios. And then I emphasize the fact that we're gonna try to do everything we can to get them beyond the median. So yeah, Oncology 2023, earlier this year, we did a program on ophthalmic issues in oncology. <laughs> ophthalmic issues, in, because all these, so many of these ADCs, even beyond ADCs, other, ertafitinib because of central serous retinopathy. So, 
being in oncology now, you got to be a renaissance physician, I think, Karen. Anyhow, let's uh, hear about your 72-year-old man. What happened with him? So um, this was a gentleman, and uh, just, as a little background, this is a, a person who's actually kind of been able to go with the flow throughout uh, the diagnosis and treatment and is uh, kind of a, a person who says, you know, Doc, tell me what to do. This is I'll, I'll do what you what you want me to do, and not the highly anxious. Um, and he comes with his wife every time. They have uh, appropriate questions and um, just just wants to keep moving forward. And uh, they're they're they they plan ahead when they can, and they are able to take a breath and and step back when they can. But um, he was uh, 72 and came in with cough and chest discomfort um, for a few months. Um, he did have a a uh, 40 pack year smoking history and had uh, quit about 10 years ago, um, had not had uh, CT screening as we see with many of these patients um, that may have benefited him, um, and had a large left upper lobe mass extending to the left hilum and uh, hitting the pericardium with mediastinal and right hilar lymphadenopathy, and uh, again, multiple pulmonary masses and a left adrenal mass. Um, the PET CT confirmed uh, uptake in the lung masses and the left adrenal. And multiple lymph nodes, also in the bone, um, in uh, several places in the bone. An MRI of the brain did not show uh, evidence of metastatic disease. So we see some of the PET scan here, just showing the multiple uh, pulmonary nodules and the larger mass on the left-hand side. The patient underwent a CT-guided biopsy of the lung mass um, and uh, showed uh, squamous cell carcinoma, um, negative for the adenocarcinoma um, markers, but positive for P P40. Um, there were no uh, alterations on molecular testing. We did do molecular testing uh, despite being squamous cell. PDL1 was modest at 30%. Um, so this was a metastatic stage four. Um, the normal uh, liver and, uh, and uh, heme function and uh, performance status was one. And so the patient uh, went on and did get frontline therapy with the combination of caroplatin, nabpaclitaxel, and pembrolizumab um, due to the PDL1 of 30%, and uh, went on to maintenance pembrolizumab with continued um, response for 18 months. Um, um, as of note, the toxicity was relatively mild uh, that the patient experienced, but did develop an interest. Um, side effect of, of cellulitis, um, which um, we treated with antibiotics, um, and it was refractory to antibiotics, yet then um, improved on uh, a, a steroid taper. And so we thought it was more, re more related to the immunotherapy um, rather than a uh, infectious cellulitis. So that was something that I hadn't uh, seen in many patients before. Um, and, but he was able to tolerate therapy and um, we had to hold several times because the cellulitis would kind of recur, but uh, overall he did well for those 18 months. Then developed progression in a hilar lymph node and in the adrenal gland. And um, so in this patient, I had a question about what we do next, um, and I, I, I put in there a fat nib um, because <laughs> officially for squamous cell carcinoma, this is an option for patients, um, not one that I use or believe in um, because the trial that got the approval compared it to erlotinib, um, which also doesn't really work in uh, patients without EGFR mutations or patients with squamous <coughs> Cell, so, but I put that on the list. Um, and then we have our standard, you know, docetaxel, docetaxel, ramucirumab, um, and uh, then uh, the, the option that I put in that we'll talk about later, pembrolizumab, ramucirumab, um, from our S1800A trial and uh, trial that is ongoing. So what's the follow-up on the patient? So the patient um, did start on the um, on, on the uh, Pragmatica trial, um, Pragmatica lung trial um, with pembrolizumab and ramucirumab, and he just recently started on this trial and uh, was ram randomized to pembrolizumab and ramucirumab. Um, but uh, with the initial response to immunotherapy and uh, and lack of uh, significant toxicity, we thought this was a good option. If the patient was randomized to standard of care, we would have given um, him docetaxel ramucirumab. So you actually continued the pembrolizumab. He was on it, and you added the ramucirumab. Correct. Well, this is on clinical trial, so we added. We, right, we but randomized yeah, into clinical, clinical trial, trial, and he got pembrolizumab with ramucirumab as uh, the next line treatment. Correct. So 
I'm going to ask Tiziana for her thoughts about the case. But first, I have to ask you, I was sort of fantasizing that the man was a farmer. But tell me, what kind of work does he do? He, I, I, he has worked, he worked as an engineer, um, but he's an outdoors kind of guy. Um, and so he enjoys, you know, uh, clay pigeon shooting and, uh, and uh, likes to be close to the earth. So I think you're, you're correct in that kind of mindset. That kind of vibe. And the other thing is, can you talk a little bit more about the cellulitis, like what it looked like? I personally have never heard that as a complication of immunotherapy. Maybe the rest of you have, but what, where was it and what did it look like? It was on his lower extremity um, and one, one more than the other. And uh, it was swelling and erythema and looked very much like your standard cellulitis, and, um, but did not respond to um, antibiotics, got admitted for IV antibiotics, antibiotics did not really respond until we started the steroids. Um, and then it became somewhat clear that it was related to the immunotherapy that, rather than uh, an infectious cause. But I, I had not seen it so before that. So, Tiziana, I'm curious, first, have you seen anything like this cellulase? And also, uh, how do you think outside a clinical trial today you would be managing a patient in this situation? So regarding the cellulitis, I've seen it. And I've seen it with immunotherapy, but I've actually more commonly seen it with the taxanes. It's like a pseudocellulitis. I've seen it with pemetrexid as well. Um, and the cases that I've used um, uh, taxanes or pemetrexid, um, I've done short courses of steroids, peri chemotherapy, and it gets them through that bind, and then they're able to do okay because there's no infection, and it depends on how severe it is. But I've gotten some patients through by giving them dexamethasone peri chemotherapy, kind of like you would do for nausea. I just extended it again for the pseudocellulitis. Um, I haven't had it a lot with um, immunotherapy, um, mainly taxanes and pemetrexid. I actually had a recent case with pemetrexid, which was a pseudocellulitis, and we managed that with steroids. So, but regarding this patient, I think standard of care, I would give docetaxel. If there's no, no contraindications for a VEGF agent, which this patient didn't have, I would use docetaxel ramacurumab. I haven't really been using a FATMIB in the squamous population, although there is an approval. I just feel like the activity isn't meaningful enough for the potential toxicities for patients in, in this um, line of therapy. I think Premboram being part of lung map conflicted, I think it would have been a great option as well on trial. Um, and I think the, you know, seeing the data from the phase two study, the tolerability was, you know, favorable compared to docetaxel and docetaxel ramacurumab. But I think standard of care, definitely going with docetaxel and then informed decision making about the Ad of ramacurumab in terms of benefits and the ads of the toxicities. So Jacob, I'm curious uh, how you generally would manage a patient like this, again, outside a clinical trial. Also the issue of would you add on as another option, you know, palliative care and not giving aggressive therapy. And when you get into this situation, uh, you know, is that a realistic consideration that maybe you're going to end up doing uh, more harm than uh, good. And sort of tying into that also, I'm curious, you know, a couple of years back, we had the incredible work uh, from uh, Jennifer Temmel and her group uh, looking at early palliative care and the benefit that that had. And I think there was a message in there. And I'm curious what the message you read out of that work. And in general, how you think, how you think through this clinical situation uh, in your practice, Jacob? Yeah, that, that a point of, of Dr. Temmel's paper is an important one, that early involvement of palliative care actually led to longer lifespan along with better quality of life. I think the better quality of life is the obvious expected part. The living longer um, was a little more surprising to me, uh, but it is, you know, further makes the point that involving palliative care earlier can lead to better outcomes. Um, as far as uh, palliative care, you know, I, I still, I, I guess from that, I'm more inclined to involve them, but that doesn't mean I just blanket involve palliative care with every, uh, for every patient. I think someone who's having symptoms, uh, we work to control those symptoms, but if that's simple, if, if that's not resolved, it's better to have others involved in, in, that, uh, in that discussion and evaluation and I'll involve palliative care. And someone where I anticipate 
uh, high risk of, of early clinical decline. I'm more in, uh, inclined to involve palliative care as, as well. And one could say, well, now in the second line of non-small cell lung cancer, uh, you know, that is a scenario where things can clinically really change, change quickly. Um, as far as uh, the therapy, you know, docetaxel alone is more commonly what I use. Um, there are select patients where ramucirumab is something I may consider more so in younger patients with excellent performance status, uh, but it's not something I use across the board in everybody. I am very interested to see what comes of Pragmatica because I, I frankly was very surprised by the results of Pembro plus ramucirumab uh, in, in that initial um, uh, single arm study, and I would love to see that uh, really play out longer term. And, and it really speaks to the fact that we still have so much to learn about pembrolizumab that by adding VEGF, we may really extend the benefits of it. Uh, and, and so I'm very hopeful that the, that the Pragmatica trial will demonstrate that. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to when Karen goes uh, through that data, uh, chatting about your thoughts uh, concerning it. Well, let's uh, move on to another case. Uh, Corey, you have a 65-year-old man. What happened with him, a former smoker, 20-pack years? So this was a uh, gentleman uh, with uh, comorbidities, including diabetes. He had presented with progressive uh, cough and dyspnea. He was originally treated, uh, you could say misdiagnosed for pneumonia, but uh, did not get better. Found to have a huge uh, right pleural effusion. He was admitted outside to uh, uh, another institution, the ICU, required a lot of oxygen. But after draining the fluid on uh, seven days of antibiotics, steroids, and nebulizers, he finally got better, at least to the point that he could be discharged on uh, nasal cannula. Um, the drainage showed adenocarcinoma, TTF1 positive, was negative for P40. And again, when it comes to markers, uh, those are probably the only two you need to do to just differentiate uh, uh, histology. Doing uh, an excess number of other markers uh, starts to uh, deplete the tissue. We want to avoid that. Unfortunately, cytology was QNS for PDL1 or NGS. He had a second tap, the same problem. Uh, he was finally transferred to Penn. Uh, brain scan was negative. PET basically lit up along the, uh, the pleura with diffuse uh, nodular hypermetabolic activity and uh, hyalur mediastinal nodes. There was no evidence of extrathoracic metastases. And finally, um, because we really needed to know his PDL1 and NGS, he had a VATS uh, where he had guided pleural biopsies, uh, intraoperative talc pleurodesis. And this was further complicated with a uh, persistent air leak, so he needed a special Heimlich valve. It took uh, two to three weeks before the uh, air leak uh, finally resolved and his uh, lung was back up. His PDL1 was positive at 60%, NGS infusion panel were negative uh, for any actionable molecular uh, abnormalities. And just by way of background, he is always accompanied by his wife. I have never seen him alone. Um, she often answers the questions I pose to him. Uh, we've seen that dynamic uh, commonly, and uh, he is a retired electrician. So here's his scan. Uh, you see the plural th uh, nodule, uh, uptake. Uh, this actually predated the uh, VATS procedure, um, a CPA angle node. And, you know, the, the initial uh, uh, dilemma we were uh, faced with, how would we uh, manage him? Would it be single-agent PEMBRO? Remember, his PDL one was 60%. Would we uh, be more aggressive with uh, Keynote 189? Would we use a 9LA regimen, Ipinevo with PEM Carbo, uh, enroll on the Insigna trial or other? So he got uh, a single-agent PEMBRO. Uh, at which point he developed progression in the right lower lobe and retroperitoneal uh, nodes. You can see the uh, involvement uh, on the right in the retroperitoneum. Uh, he continued PEMBRO, and at this point we grafted pemetrexid and carbo onto that regimen, and then ultimately shifted to combination PEMBRO, um, pemetrexid maintenance. And he's, uh, the progression occurred within 10 months. It's sort of similar to Jacob's case. Uh, but his uh, response to the uh, Keynote 189 approach lasted over two years, and he stayed on uh, maintenance PEM squared, is what some of us call it, for 42 cycles, profound PR, but eventually developed worsening renal insufficiency. His creat, I think, ultimately hit 2.5, so he stopped initially the said in December 21, and then discontinued Pembro earlier this year when his creat hit three. And again, you can see the improvement uh, a lot of disease here in the right lower lobe, consolidation. And if we go from uh, right to left, uh, uh, 
major decrease in the amount of uh, involvement. So he's observed off Antonia plastics placed on steroids for his presumed immune uh, checkpoint inhibitor mediated nephritis. His uh, creative and uh, gradually improved to 1.7. Amidst all of this, he developed CNS metastases. He underwent uh, stereotactic therapy. Uh, for that, he also developed chest pain and shortness of breath. So the comorbidities were starting to re uh, rear themselves. And again, these are smokers, so uh, or past smokers. So other uh, medical issues don't, don't uh, disappear. He required stents for uh, coronary insufficiency. Unfortunately, uh, four months ago, he developed recurrent shortness of breath. He was back on intermittent O2 with uh, exercise, and his CT showed uh, progression. You can see here on the right with the uh, um, new right lower lobe masses. So again, what's the next step? Um, do we go back to Pembro uh, with or without Pemetrexed now that his creats improved, perhaps with some steroids on board? Do we use Karen's approach, the S1800, resume Pembro and add Ramiseramab? Do we stop, uh, start docetaxel or docetaxel Rami? Or particularly after this three, uh, two and a half year hiatus, is there a role for resuming carbo? and adding a taxane, which he's never been exposed to, and then adding either bevacizumab or ramaciramab. Well, here's the answer, at least what I did. Uh, <laughs> uh, we actually have an uh, in-house clinical trial where we're doing that, uh, carbo with NABPAC, nanoparticle albumin-bound uh, paclitaxel, carbo dosed in AUC of uh, six with the NABPAC at 100 per meter squared days, one and eight every three weeks, uh, combined um, on trial with ramaciramab, it's specifically geared for patients who have had at least six cycles of maintenance pem pembro. Uh, so it's a, basically, a, a, you could say a salvage regimen, a com combination salvage regimen in uh, individuals whose disease progressed on Keynote 189 uh, maintenance. But I think certainly any of the last three options could uh, be reasonable, whether it's docetaxel rami or uh, the carbo combination. Uh, Resuming Pembro and even Pemetrexa in this gentleman with renal insufficiency is dicey. Uh, and I, uh, I, I was not particularly disposed to that. I think if push came to shove and he started to have progression here, I, I would at least at some point perhaps contemplate going back to an IO. So he's, uh, you don't know whether he's responding yet to the current. Uh, he is or... actually. So the uh, panel really? in the middle. Hmm. On the right is the baseline in the middle. This is uh, follow-up scans as of uh, June, and you can see the nodules are uh, starting to diminish. Uh, his pulse ox is back in the 90s, and he's resumed most of his ADLs. So I'm going to ask Karen in a second to respond to the case, and also maybe preceding a little bit about her getting into the data, uh, your vision about whether there's a difference in uh, efficacy when you combine BEV Ramuseramab or a VEGF TKI with an IO. But first, uh, just one more comment from uh, Corey. You know, I was reflecting back on your comment about how you feel like you're parachuting into a patient's life. And I think in this case, it sounds like you were parachuting into a war. What an incredible story <laughs> uh, to have to deal with all these complications. What's it been like to, how, how has he and his family responded? I mean, he's been through a lot already. And we have constant discussions of whether, uh, you know, it's worth continuing, uh, whether the uh, continued uh, toxicity and also the, I guess, the, uh, the burden of his comorbidities um, is uh, something that he can uh, confront even as he continues to confront his cancer. He's a little bit like Karen's patient, uh, do or die, keep, keep going until you, I say otherwise. And uh, he generally cuts those conversations short. How can you not treat my cancer? Of course, we're going to go ahead. So, I, you know, I, I don't tend to delve further. I, I tend, if patients start to express some degree of ambivalence, or particularly if family members do, then I will explore that uh, conversation in much more detail. Um, he's weathered the storm. He's successfully gone through uh, SRS for the brain. His heart seems to be functioning a lot better. Unfortunately or unfortunately, we often end up becoming the de facto internist for these patients. And that's probably not our role. Uh, I think ideally we need to keep the, uh, the primary care doctor and other uh, disciplines involved uh, because we can't manage it all. We can barely manage the oncologic issues. So uh, this, uh, the, the phrase that takes a village really applies to this gentleman. I and mean, he has a, a care team that includes at least four or five other physicians.
and of course they're you know, nurse practitioners. There were so many complications and things that you were just talking about. But has he had periods of time, like even now, where he, you know, has you know good performance status and feels good? Oh yes, absolutely. Uh, before his uh, kidney function started to deteriorate, he was quite active. Uh, his big joy is going out to uh, local diners, having coffee, going to local bake shops. I'm a big guy. He's a much bigger guy. He's pretty heavy. And uh, food and eating are high priorities. Yeah, I'm still stuck on that whiskey club. I don't know what a whiskey club is exactly. <laughs> but anyhow, Karen, any thoughts about the case in general? And also my question about, you know, this sort of to me, a mystery of why anti-angiogenics seem to potentiate IOs and which one works better. So I, yeah, I think this um, case gives us a, a lot of, a lot to talk about um, from the I think the, the first thing that strikes me as you talk about um, uh, Dr. Langer with uh, with needing the village and often with these patients who have multiple comorbidities and get diagnosed with lung cancer most of their their physicians step away and say okay your oncologist has got you now and there's still a lot of nihilism associated with a diagnosis of metastatic lung cancer even though we're in this era where people People are living for years and years, which you know didn't happen 20 years ago, but is definitely happening now. So we absolutely need um, the the primary care doctors and the whole uh, group of specialists that the patient may have needed before getting diagnosed with lung cancer. So I think that's important, and I think again the the importance of seeing that the patient got um, reintroduced to carbo uh, a, a carbo based regimen after recurring, I think is also really important. A person with this type of comorbidities, you may see um, people thinking, oh, let's give him weekly docetaxel or something for um, somebody who is more frail. And I like the idea of going back to a platinum-based regimen after somebody has a prolonged period off, because this is kind of what we would have done before the eras of immunotherapy, when we when we had one a patient who did really well on the initial chemo came off for a period of time, we would have reintroduced it. And so um, I do like that strategy. And uh, the question whether I, I would even think about potentially using the Empower 150 regimen and giving both uh, immunotherapy and, uh, and uh, VEGF therapy for this patient in, in addition to the chemotherapy. Um, but I, I like that. And I, I think we, we, we need better treatments than docetaxel and docetaxel RAM. And so I appreciate that this patient was able to get, um, again, a, a more of a frontline regimen after a, after a period of time off of therapy. Um, and I, so, and then, so speaking of the, the VEGF piece, it seems to me so far, um, as we get more and more of the phase three data and negative trials that are coming out, um, that we do see a difference between VEGF uh, TKIs and VEGF um, antibodies. And um, this may be due to um, enhanced immunomodulation that we get with the antibodies. Um, we see most of the VEGF um, combinations with TKIs and immunotherapy are active in diseases where the VEGF TKIs are already active as single agents, which we don't have a, in non-small cell lung cancer. So that may be part of it too. So I think there are multiple uh, reasons why we're, we have been less successful in uh, combining um, VEGF TKIs with uh, immunotherapy and lung cancer. Just to follow up on that, Karen, what about the difference between ramucirumab and bevacizumab? Um, you know, obviously they have slightly different mechanisms. From the point of view of potentiation of IOs, do we know whether one is more effective than the other? I, I, I really can't speak to that. I mean, there may be some, the, the subtle differences may be important, but I, I don't have, I, I think we've used more ramucirumab um, especially in the refractory setting, because that's kind of where it's, it's approved and where we've used it on patients. But um, I, don't, I don't have a, a good explanation for that at this point. And, uh, and I, I don't think we have the, the, uh, the biology for that. Um, I, maybe Jacob, I, I asked that, I've asked that question a million times. Nobody has any answers, but maybe Jacob, you do. 
No, I don't have an answer to that, but I did want to point out that in each of these patients, they qualify for lung screening, and it, and, uh, it likely was not done in these cases. And when we talk about what can be done to impact cancer mortality, not just lung cancer mortality, but cancer mortality, there's probably not anything that exists that can impact cancer mortality as much as lung screening has the potential to do so, just given the very high numbers of, of uh, lung cancer fatalities. And so I just wanted to take an opportunity to make the point that we see so many patients with stage four disease, and really the majority of them likely could have been diagnosed in stage one had they been getting yearly lung screening, which is USPSDF guidelines now for a decade. And this is just a really important message for us to continue to get out into uh, other centers. That's a really great point. One other uh, question I have before we get to this uh, last case uh, from Tiziana. Uh, to you, Corey. Every time I hear the word carboplatin nowadays, I immediately think of the uh, current shortage that's going on also with cisplatin. We, this comes up every solid tumor program we do nowadays. Just kind of curious in non-small cell lung cancer, Corey, I don't know if you've had a problem accessing carbo, but for if you do or for those many people who do, what are you recommending? What's ASCO recommending first-line therapy with the non as an example? Uh, we've been hit by the carbo shortage. Fortunately, we've got, just recently got a, a big shipment in that's going to last us at least a month. But they're scrambling. Uh, it's uh, been a big uh, problem. It looks to be an ongoing problem, and it, it, it's constantly blamed on supply line. But th at the end of the day, it's health economics. It, there's very little um, profit margin in making these uh, generic agents. And I suspect it's going to take more than just... Uh, our pharmacies and our hospitals, it's going to take uh, legislation of some sort to make sure that life-saving drugs, uh, um, drugs that are used uh, in the adjuvant setting with improved survival, that they're adequately uh, available. Um, in metastatic setting, we do have the ipinevo combination, so uh, there's at least something we could potentially fall back on. I have on at least one occasion done that. Uh, but that patient had other uh, potential indications, squamous histology, and I believe a PDL one that was uh, uh, not measurable. So, patient, you might have considered going that approach regardless. Uh, but uh, it's a huge challenge and something that, that's always been there, but it seems to be a lot more pervasive and persistent at this point. So just to clarify though a little bit more, Karen, what do you recommend to someone who cannot access carbo? So yeah, if, if we cannot access carbo, gen and these are patients with refractory disease, um, they're going to be the first to not receive it. We're going to save it for patients who have uh, potentially curable, so in the more the adjuvant or potentially neoadjuvant setting, um, or in, in diseases that uh, that that have more curable outcomes. So. For that patient, I think I'd be moving. I'd ha I ha you'd have to move to something like docetaxel ramucirumab or something like that. Hmm, interesting. Well, maybe we can. If, if you have any more thoughts about that, we can talk about it later. But let's do one more case. Uh, Tiziana, you have a 68-year-old woman. What happened with her? So this is a 68-year-old female. She's a retired accountant. Presented with loss of appetite, 20-pound weight loss over the past four months fatigue and shortness of breath on exertion associated with a cough. Her past medical history was significant for hypertension, which is well controlled and hyperlipidemia. She had a diagnosis of microscopic colitis, as collagenous colitis, and she'd had like a mild flare three months prior to her diagnosis that did require management with lower dose budesonide. So on physical exam, um, she has good performance status. Um, she had mild wheezing on exam at initial encounter and she ultimately underwent a liver biopsy. Um, she had evidence of lung disease with a right hilar mass, hilar adenopathy, mediastinal adenopathy, and liver disease as well, negative brain MRI, and she underwent a liver biopsy that demonstrated squamous cell carcinoma. Her PDL1, I'll tell you about it in the next setting, she was treated at an outside hospital, but given her diagnosis of microscopic colitis, um, outside consultant did not want to treat with immunotherapy up front, so she actually underwent treatment with plain old carboplatin paclitaxel for four cycles, and then went on to observation. Um, additional treatment uh, was limited by development of neuropathy, and then imaging after that demonstrated progression. 
Um, the inflammatory bowel disease, the microscopic colitis, she had followed up with GI, had been well controlled, hadn't required any systemic immunosuppression beyond budesonide with the local effects and lower dose budesonide for about eight months. So here is the imaging um, at progression. Um, she's had now evidence of progression with worsening disease. You can see some cavitation in that lung um, with associated adenopathy and the liver metastasis are shown on the right. Her PDL1 was done um, at consultation with a PDL1 of 60%. Um, and here, uh, no genetic testing was performed. Um, with the squamous cell carcinoma. She did initiate treatment now. We had this long discussion about, you know, did she qualify for the lunar study um, given her prior diagnosis of well-controlled inflammatory bowel disease? Um, and given the sort of the mild flare that she had after discussion and meeting criteria for the trial, she actually enrolled with the choice of atezolizumab, the PDL1 inhibitor, as the systemic therapy associated with tumor treating fields therapy. She did well and she achieved a CR with a response rate in the liver and as well as in the lung, although she had the residual cavitation there. Her main side effect with the treatment was grade two rash and this was associated with tumor treating fields therapy and it was associated with the adhesive bandages and was not a sort of a widespread rash. Um, given the grade two nature, this was managed with holding tumor treating fields therapy for one week. Um, and then we used topical steroids and educated her on skin care. You have to rotate the, um, the adhesive bandages about two centimeters every three to four days, um, making sure that the skin was dry and clean um, and also just applying emollients. And she did well and stayed on therapy um, for a total of eight months and then went off for progression. What's her current status? So, this was a patient that I treated at the University of Wisconsin, and the, the study actually was done a long time ago. So I, I don't have the follow-up for her, um, but you know the standard of care for her at that time would have been docetaxel plus minus ramaciramab. So interesting. Uh, so uh, Corey, I'm curious what your thoughts about this case. I guess one thing would be, in, uh, the outside uh, oncologists decide not to use an IO in spite of the fact that she had a PD-1 level of 60%. Uh, I'm curious, given what you heard about her autoimmune history, what would you think you likely would have also held off or you maybe would have gone ahead with an IO, Corey? I would have been uh, conflicted, but I think I might have gone ahead assuming the uh, outside uh, consultants, rheumatology and GI uh, we're following the patient along with me. Uh, the patient's uh, collagenous uh, uh, colitis was under good control. We will often uh, institute uh, immunotherapy in individuals who uh, are on low dose steroids, five or 10 milligrams of prednisone a day, or, res or resume the IOs after they've had uh, toxicity management with steroids uh, at those dose levels. I, I don't know what the full dose was, Tiziana, but. Uh, uh, I think that might have been a situation where I would have bent the rules. And as uh, I, needless to say, this individual would not have qualified for a clinical trial that allowed uh, immunotherapy. But I think in the real world, in actual clinical practice, many of us have started bending the rules. We've developed at least some comfort level with milder disorders. Um, the 60% is awful compelling. And uh, whether it was PEMBRO or um, PEM uh, uh, combination with platinum and carbo, uh, uh, it, the, it would have been a debate with the liver mets. I think I might have done the, uh, the triplet. I'm intrigued uh, when Tiziana mentioned that the patient responded to the tumor treating fields, and that included the liver lesions, where the tumor treating fields are not necessarily in uh, continuity. They're over the chest lesion. Isn't that correct, Tiziana? So, yeah. Um, the tumor treating fields does um, reach the upper abdomen. Mm -hmm. And again, we'll talk about this in our discussion, right. but you know, the thought that perhaps tumor treating fields with IO can lead to immunogenic cell death and have systemic effects versus you know, local effects or the combination, I think is still being investigated. I think that you know, many of us would call that an epscopal effect or uh, perhaps or uh, some combination thereof. And I, 
that makes the, uh, the whole notion of adding this device to standard treatment, particularly to immunotherapy, where it's shown the greatest benefit as Tissian will uh, expand upon, uh, quite uh, uh, attractive. Just to I will be clear, say, though, you know, this Tissiana. case was like, this case was a long okay. time ago. So remember, we didn't have PDL one testing in 2015. Interesting. Um, one thing I wanted to clarify, Tiziana, the way the device is set up, does it actually cover the liver? Or, or how much of the liver um, does it cover if it does? So the, the, the arrays are sort of, um, they are placed on the patient's chest and it covers the upper abdomen. The way the treatment plan is created is based on the patient's CT scans. So there is some coverage of the upper abdomen, which will include the liver the upper part of the liver, it doesn't include the entire liver. So uh, I meant to ask you all before we got started, maybe just to show of hands other than Tiziana, the three of you, how many of you actually had a patient who got tumor treating fields? Okay, so I guess Tiziana is the only person. So I'm kind of curious, you know, we get a lot of questions, Tiziana, and you know, we'll talk about this later too, but just since you brought up this woman uh, what her quality of life was like and how, how much of was it impacted uh, by the therapy. Um, also, what you've seen and how her skin uh, reaction or irritation compares to others. We heard the same story. Uh, uh, it's being used in ovarian cancer. Uh, so I kind of I heard of a couple of cases there. But I'm just kind of curious what it was like for her to use the device. Yeah, you know, at the time, it was kind of a, and I think even for now, it's, it's a very novel way of thinking about treating um, lung cancer. So this patient was randomized to tumor treating fields therapy. Um, we had a lot of education and for us, it was all novel as well. We had a lot, a lot of support from the device company who really did troubleshoot a lot of the device related issues at the patient's home. The rash itself was kind of like a folliculitis kind of rash. Um, and it was localized to the area, but certainly got to the point where we felt we needed to hold to make sure that it um, got better. And then we were able to reintroduce it with these measures. Um, in terms of, you know, the quality of life, the main thing was just coping or dealing with having the device on for 18 hours a day or as close to 18 hours a day as possible. That part was a bit of a challenge for her to make sure that she had it for 75% of her day. She wore it um, as a little backpack and took it to places. People didn't know she had the device. So there wasn't a social concern about it. It was more just being aware. And I think for her, it was a little bit about like it reminded her that she had to wear a device because she had lung cancer. And so she kind of had to cope with that, um, that idea and I think she did as best as possible and we gave her all the support that she needed. One thing that we had at the University of Wisconsin is we had palliative care in clinic with us. So I'm a big believer of early palliative care just for that support. And I always tell my patients, this is an extra layer of support. And they were also very helpful in providing so additional recommendations even outside of the trial to help her cope with sort of this new idea of having a device. Yeah, it's very interesting. I never thought to ask. I kind of assumed that it would be obvious to people that the, the patients were wearing a device. It's very interesting that you're saying, in fact, that it is not. I'm just kind of curious, uh, Jacob, but we'll talk more about this later after we take a look at the data. But just sort of thinking about this type of therapy, I was just reflecting. We did a webinar on pancreatic cancer where they're also studying tumor treating fields, so we were talking about it. And, you know, pancreatic cancer, chemotherapy really doesn't work very well, immunotherapy doesn't work, targeted therapy doesn't work, and I was like, well, at least, you know, it's you know, another strategy, a different uh, type of look uh, or different type of approach. Any thoughts about this, Jacob? You know, people, I remember at the uh, Society of Neuro-Oncology, I, I mean, 10 years ago when this first got introduced and everybody was like, what is this? Any thoughts in general about if it does turn out that we have convincing data how people are going to react to the actual pragmatics of this, Jacob? 
Yeah, that's such an important point that, that uh, Tiziana brings up, is wearing that around reminded the patient that they have cancer. And I was kind of getting at that aspect earlier, I think, with hair loss. Uh, that's, an, that's another one of those things where, yes, there is a look to it and such, but for patients, they're now looking like what they picture as someone with cancer. And first line, getting carboplatin, pemetrexid, and Pembro, for example, although patients are getting chemo, they walk through the store and nobody knows that they have it. This one is kind of a blend of those, because walking around with a backpack, nobody knows, but the patient is reminded constantly of that and can't mentally escape it. And it brings up that aspect of, of care that I was kind of alluding to with the initial case in that um, so much of the work is deciphering where patients are psychologically and mentally and emotionally and then tailoring our discussion to really that where they're coming from. Many patients, or, or I'd say everybody, experiences life in an emotional way and we tend to discuss cases in these intellectual ways. And for patients, I think that's where the real disconnect, where patients feel like, you know, you're not talking to, with each other but kind of past is that they're discussing things um, emotionally and we're coming at them in these very intellectual ways and so recognizing that like Tiziana did with this patient and then being able to kind of find ways to help them process that or picture it in a different way and in some cases a, a common way with chemotherapy for example is people will kind of picture it as being this terribly toxic thing and so there's a lot of fear around that and and so you know I'll try to discuss it more as this army going in to attack the cancer and just the way that they're mentally holding the imagery around some of these things now for some people that works and for some people it doesn't and frankly I also, it's hard to even imagine, even though I'm seeing these patients all the time, um, to, to where, where they really are and where that internal challenge really is. Uh, but it is an aspect of oncology that I think is really important in optimal management. Yeah, these are such uh, great comments, uh, really interesting. You know, we, uh, all of our work, when we, we go to the Oncology Nursing Society Congress every year, we usually, we, this year we did 10 symposia. But the umbrella under that is called what I tell my patients. And I think people value so much, you know, particularly new to oncology, like what do you really, what do you say? You know, the, these pearls that come out and hopefully we'll get a lot more as we go through this program. We're gonna shift now and get into the uh, presentation part. And Corey is gonna uh, provide some perspective on second line treatment, the main uh, topic that we're talking about today, since in general that's where uh, people post IO are getting treated. Corey, could you please uh, go through your your slides? Thank you, Neil. This has uh, been a great discussion so far. So I'm really going to set the stage for what I think is the current standard of care, and hopefully uh, our my colleagues will show how that's going to change. This is my current paradigm for frontline treatment, uh, at least as of this month. I think it could change at any moment, but certainly 50% or higher PDL1 we treat with uh, uh, generally with Pembro, either alone or combined with uh, histology appropriate chemo if patients are uh, uh, highly symptomatic or have large tumor burden. For less than 50%, Generally, it's histology-appropriate chemo plus Pembro. There is an indication for Pembro alone with any degree of PDL1 expression, but by and large, that is not favored. For no PDL1, high TMB, uh, perhaps squamous uh, histology, you can make an argument for Ipinevo or 9LA. For those who are TKI refractory, and uh, Karen talked about these individuals, uh, probably about 30 to 40 percent of our population these days. Uh, the role of IO is less well settled. So Pem Carbo with or without Bevacizumab would be a standard in non-squamous, or as she mentioned, the Empower 150 regimen, uh, Pac Carbo Bevitezo, but again, after the patients have established uh, progression on uh, the appropriate TKIs. And I think when it's uh, QNS and we're reasonably assured that patient probably doesn't have a molecular marker, we default to either 189 or 407. And of course, the Poseidon approach, which is essentially 9LA on steroids with uh, uh, the chemo continued beyond two cycles, but uh, continually um, is also an option. This is the Insigna trial I included as one of the choices in my case, uh, uh, taking patients with PDL1 positive, non squamous, and randomly assigning them to either Pembro alone or uh, Pembro combined with uh, chemotherapy. So, a direct comparison of 024 to 189, but with progression at the time of progression, testing whether continuation of a checkpoint inhibitor beyond progression actually adds to outcome. So, uh, 
there are actually three arms. So arm A at the time of progression to go on to chemo alone, arm B, chemo combined with Pembro. And that's, that theme is carried on as well with the uh, uh, S1800 and ongoing Pragmatica trial. Does uh, continuation of IOs beyond uh, uh, progression uh, confer any benefit? In this era of checkpoint inhibitors, uh, we are seeing five-year survival rates now, 30% sometimes higher with high PDL1, but the majority of these individuals still uh, will experience disease progression after checkpoint inhibitors with or without chemo, most within a year of treatment initiation. And once progression manifests, death, unfortunately, with rare exception, is inevitable. Uh, the mechanisms of uh, checkpoint inhibition really have to do with the immune cascade, uh, inability of to, uh, T cells to traffic into tumors, failure to actually infiltrate within the tumor itself, the failure of um, uh, T cells to recognize the tumor even if they are at the tumor site, inadequate cell kill or inadequate release of antigens uh, that can stimulate the, tum uh, the uh, uh, T cells, whether it's in the nodes or elsewhere. And at each point, there are additional uh, checkpoints or uh, regulatory processes that can be manipulated. And this is really uh, underscores how we are uh, trying to combat this, at least in trials. Vaccines, of course, are being added to checkpoint inhibitors, either generic or personalized. Uh, there is a role for uh, potentially adding uh, chemo, radiation, for that matter, uh, microwave ablation or other ablative approaches uh, in the uh, hope of uh, triggering tumor antigen release and immune stimulation. Adoptive T cell therapy uh, is being looked at, including CAR T. And then, of course, an array of uh, monoclonal antibodies targeting either co stimulatory signals or removing co inhibitory signals. And again, uh, there are uh, scores of trials uh, evaluating these approaches in this setting. So we set the stage. Uh, the standard of care, I would argue, is still docetaxel with ramucirumab. Whether other cytotoxic have a role is uh, debatable. Uh, Tissiana is going to talk about tumor treating fields. Jacob about ADCs in uh, depth. And uh, Karen will talk uh, about uh, the uh, continuation of uh, checkpoint inhibitor combined with uh, angiogenesis inhibitor, in this case, uh, Pembro Ramu. Uh, there is another approach, uh, we haven't really talked about that, and that is local ablative therapies for oligoprogression. And I would get, say about 30% of my patients are experiencing oligoprogression. And in that situation, it may be completely feasible to continue the checkpoint inhibitor along with local radiation. The REVEL trial uh, is, uh, actually predates the IO era. Second line um, included both squamous and non-squamous. Uh, docetaxel, the standard of care, plus or minus ramucirumab, with the primary endpoint of overall survival. Uh, and you can see it hit the primary endpoint, uh, uh, p-value of 0.0236 with a hazard ratio of 0.85. You also see a month and a half improvement in progression-free survival and an improvement in response rate from 14% to 23%. And these uh, the p-values in this very large study were highly positive. So this was the first study in second-line non-small cell to show a survival benefit versus docetaxel alone. It took us nearly 20 years to get to that point. It was only another year when the checkpoint inhibitors emerged on the scene. And this was the first study I'm aware of to show a benefit for an angiogenesis inhibitor in squamous cell. You can see the curves, statistically significant, clinically modest improvements in both progression-free and overall survival, but it's still my standard of care outside of a clinical trial. When it comes to toxicity, uh, there is a slight increase in pulmonary hemorrhage from 2.4% to 3.8%, but I would argue 5% or less is probably acceptable. And I, I think even though there is uh, increased uh, toxicity, including febrile neutropenia, this combination is doable. I tend to adopt the Japanese dose, 60 per meter squared, as opposed to 75 per meter squared. You do see increased incidence of hypertension, uh, leukopenia, but these are uh, by and large manageable. The big question is, what are the data for this combination post-IO era? So this is a retrospective analysis from Japan looking at 152 patients who had been treated uh, with nivolumab, many in the second line setting, who then went on to salvage cytotoxics, 40 of whom about half received combination ramucirumab and docetaxel. And the response, you can see the demographics on the left. The duration of prior nevo is pretty short. It was only about two months Response rate here was 60%. So again, a small series, but pretty impressive. The disease control rate was essentially 90%. There were no surprises when it came to toxicity. Another um, trial from Europe, 
uh, looking at docetaxel and rami, again, as palliative second line uh, following first line chemo, plus checkpoint inhibitors, more modern uh, era, uh, published just two years ago, and uh, treatment of lung cancer review, 77 patients, response rate of 33%, disease control rate of 62%, median PFS just under four months, uh, somewhat less salutary median survival, seven and a half months with KRAS mutations, augering poorer outcomes and lower PFS. And then finally, probably one of the biggest uh, real world experiences is uh, combination uh, ramiserumab and docetaxel in the reactive study. This was from Japan, uh, looked at uh, 280 individuals. Uh, virtually all got the 60 per meter squared dose, which I typically use. Uh, they received a median of four cycles of therapy. The response rate here about 28%, disease control rate about 60%. You see a PFS of 4.6 months and median survival of 11.6 months. In multivariate analysis, non-adenocarcinoma histology and poor performance status, no surprise, were associated with poor progression-free uh, and overall survival. Finally, uh, in the last minute or so, other second line strategies. Is there a role for bevacizumab beyond progression? What about the afatinib approach uh, that Karen had uh, alluded to? Uh, this is a trial I was associated with, uh, the AVALL trial, which is a randomized phase three of standard of care at that time, pemetrexid, docetaxel, or allotinib, with or without continuation of bevacizumab beyond progression. This is the study schema, and that BEV could actually continue beyond second and even third progression. Overall survival is the primary endpoint. The secondary endpoints included P, uh, PFS2 and PFS3, and that's progression uh, time from randomization to second and third progression. Uh, primary endpoint was not met. The hazard ratio here is 0.84. You see a numerical one and a half month advantage with a p value of 0.1. Uh, but PFS3 actually was met. You see a statistically significant improvement in or delay in progression if you continue BEV beyond even the uh, second line approaches. Uh, has a ratio of 0.63 and a p-value of 0.045. Uh, so uh, a potential approach, but I think the conclusion, the last bullet really applies to our modern era. Can we apply angiogenesis in inhibitors uh, to immunotherapy combinations? And finally, the Lux Lung 8 uh, trial that led to a FATNIVS approval specifically in squamous in second line, again, predating the IO era, a direct comparison to Erlotinib. Remember, before the era of targeted therapy, Erlotinib had a blanket second and third line approval, regardless of histology. So it was, uh, you could argue, at least a standard at that time. Big trial, nearly 800 patients, half of whom had responded to uh, prior uh, chemotherapy. Um, virtually all had squamous histology, and in fact, the study was positive. You see a 1.2-month improvement in median survival, has a ratio of 0.83 and a p-value, and this is the update just from two years ago in clinical medicine, p-value of 0.0193, but as Karen implied, we don't tend to use it very much. PFS was significantly improved. Uh, response rates were really low, 5.5% compared to 2.8%, disease control rate of 50% versus 39%. Finally, uh, this is an ongoing trial in our institution. I alluded to this uh, combination carbo uh, with uh, NAB pack or solvent-based paclitaxel, 80 per meter squared days, one and eight, combined with ramiserumab. And this is specifically designed for individuals who've had disease progression on PEM, PEMBRO in the Keynote 189 regimen. We've accrued about 12 patients to date. So uh, just a few uh, follow-up thoughts. Uh, maybe I'll start with uh, Tiziana. Any thoughts about uh, why we see progression on checkpoint inhibitors, mechanisms of resistance, predictors of benefits, and any sort of personal hopes you have about any particular strategy to try to improve uh, uh, benefit? I guess the uh, addition of antiangiogenics certainly would fall into that category, but I'm just kind of curious uh, Tiziana, what are your thoughts about how uh, we can improve uh, activity of checkpoint inhibitors? Now, one thing that I think is increasingly important is to identify not only predictors of benefit, but predictors of potential risk of, you know, lack of benefit. So talking a little bit about NGS and looking at those negative NGS bad actors like KEEP1 and SDK11, and do we need to treat those patients in a different way given the concern of 
um, lack of benefit in patients with these mutations. So that's one thing. Continue to work on biomarkers of benefit is another one. I, we know PDL1 is a marker of benefit. We saw the patient in our case with high PDL1 that had sort of less, a bit, less benefit than we thought they would with Dr. Langer's case, um, realizing that PDL1 is a good biomarker, but not perfect. So I definitely think we might need. Um, sort of combination of biomarkers to look at benefit from immunotherapy. Um, in terms of second line and beyond, I think the four cases we discussed really outlines how this is a population of high met need. Every single one of us actually recommended a different therapy than the standard of care for our patients. And I think that says a lot. Um, and I think that really means that, you know, doing clinical trials and getting the answers in a sort of prospective fashion. Um, I'm not really impressed with the activity of docetaxel RAM post IO on its own. I think there's a lot of retrospective data, um, but the overall survival there is still like eight to nine months. And that is not better than the retrospective studies that we've seen with post progression use of IO. I definitely think the strategy of um, you know, the Pragmatica study looks very promising, hoping to see there the combination of IO plus, you know, ramaciramab panning out. And then I think we need to think beyond, you know, the platinum rechallenge setting, which is really hard for patients. There may be a role, but the toxicities are really high. And can we develop better therapies with better duration of response for our patients? Thinking about novel um, checkpoints, I think, is going to be key. And then also, of course, the ADC story. So, uh, Jacob, I'm <clears throat> curious about your thoughts about how we could get more about immunotherapy. I'm curious whether you think, you know, obviously anti-CTLA-4 is being pursued. I'm curious uh, whether you think that has much future. Also, other checkpoints. So, we just did a webinar last night on uh, melanoma. We were talking about relatinib, uh, the anti-LAG3 agent whether other checkpoints might be helpful in the future, Jacob. Any thoughts? Well, I'll admit I've never been a, a big proponent for CTLA-4 inhibition. I, I, I've, it just seems that uh, overall, the majority of patients, uh, there tends to be a bit more toxicity than benefit. That being said, there is a compelling tail to the curve that identifies that there might be a subset of individuals that truly are benefiting. I don't think we've yet really been able to identify uh, who those specific patients are. There are kind of some next generation CTLA-4 inhibition that, that I think, um, you know, we'll see if that helps improve some of the uh, uh, efficacy versus uh, toxicity. And so there's certainly more to the story, and I don't mean that as, as a closing of the door entirely, but just that I don't think we've yet really identified them. As far as other, um, uh, other immunotherapy drugs, you know, they're, like LAG3, there's a, a lot of enthusiasm about that. Um, I haven't really seen uh, results to celebrate in the same way as what we've really hoped for. Um, the, actually, the thing I'm most excited about really is something out of Dave Barbie's lab, a colleague of mine, uh, looking at EZH2 inhibition uh, and how that might uh, help uh, impact some of, some of the outcomes. This is still, you know, preclinical data, and, and some of this is now uh, I'm hoping to, to bring into the clinic. There are some uh, clinical trials now happening with EZH2 inhibition, and so we'll see what some of that shows. Uh, but as far as uh, what's being used in the clinic right now, um, there isn't a, there isn't something that's really the the PD1 PDL1 inhibitor level like that changed the paradigm. So uh, EZH2 like tazimetastat. That's right. Interesting. So the idea to combine that with an IO. Yeah, that is that is one of uh, the trials that's out there. Um, how exactly these uh, alter the immune environment? Um, you know, there's still a lot to learn uh, from that. Uh, now, this is something particularly within small cell uh, that, uh, that I'm very interested in, uh, and some of his work has really been around small cell. How these might translate into into other settings? Uh, there's still a lot to know. I think what I'm highlighting is really that. Um, I think it'll, it'll take some years to develop out some of what I find the most compelling concepts. Lag3 is something that, you know, gosh, I think like eight years ago, uh, I was really looking forward to that coming into the clinics and such, and, and unfortunately that hasn't really panned out, at least thus far, in the way that, uh, that, we, that we'd hoped. Um, so I, I, 
I guess I still think we're kind of some years before it's like, uh, before we see a next level paradigm shift. So a final comment from uh, Karen, anything you want to add to this discussion? Any uh, new uh, research approaches that uh, have you excited or interested, particularly something that uh, might sort of add on to immunotherapy, but even beyond that? So I, I think that the, the first comment is that as we've seen here, this is a very heterogeneous field. Um, there is no one kind of second line, subsequent line. So we have patients who have received single agent uh, immunotherapy, PD-1, PD-L1. We have, have patients who have received immunotherapy with chemotherapy, potentially patients who have received combined um, uh, immunotherapies with CTLA-4. And the mechanisms, some of these are primary resistance, some of these are acquired resistance, and then the multitude of uh, possibilities, as Corey pointed out, of, uh, of acquired resistance are many. And so to treat them as one group, I think that's where we do a disservice. And as, as Tiziana mentioned, we, ha we, we make these decisions that are very subtle based on how long they were on prior therapy, what toxicities they had, whether they responded to single agent immunotherapy. We're thinking about all of these things and it's a very complicated algorithm that we're looking at. And then we decide in a trial that we're going to lump all these patients together and treat them together. And then we get a multitude of negative trials. And so I think we have to think more um, strategically about how we're, how we're doing this. And, um, and, and I think that ultimately selection is going to be beneficial in this subsequent line therapy if we can find those selection markers. But that, that's been elusive to this date, and I don't have a marker that is, um, you know, the magic marker right now. Um, but I, I think that's where we need to go, and we need to understand why patients are having uh, tumor progression post-IO and um, start to be more, have more rational designs for our trials. Okay, so uh, we're going to um, continue now with our presentation, and uh, Karen uh, is going to talk about the potential role of novel immunotherapy-based combination strategies. Uh, Karen, could you please go through your talk? Thank you. So this will focus mainly on uh, immunotherapy-based combinations with anti-angiogenics, um, since there's a lot of data in that area. This is just the background that we saw from Corey, um, that we have approved options. Um, the uh, intentative is a uh, European option, but what we see here is that the progression-free and overall survival still leaves a lot of room for uh, drug development in the second line and subsequent treatment setting. So thinking about angiogenesis, um, we do know that angiogenesis can modulate the immune system and that VEGF can induce PD-L1 expression, um, especially on dendritic cells and suppress the maturation of, uh, of T cells and uh, impede T cell extravasation. It can inhibit proliferation and cytotoxicity of the CTLs and stimulate um, proliferation of regulatory T cells in the immune microenvironment and also can mediate the the effects of myeloid-derived suppressor cells, so causing an immunosuppressive environment overall. Inhibition of VEGF can restore many of these phenotypes. Um, VEGF receptor 2 specifically may uh, decrease the infiltration of suppressive immune cells um, while increasing mature dendritic cells. So combining the blockade of PD-1, specifically pembrolizumab and VEGF receptor 2, as is with ramucirumab, um, may overcome resistance um, by reducing new vascularization, upregulating pro-inflammatory cytokines, and modulating the tumor microenvironment. So we know that VEGF and VEGF uh, receptor inhibition um, has been combined with immune checkpoint inhibition um, successfully in the clinic. Um, most of the FDA approvals that we have um, are based on frontline therapy and, uh, and immunotherapy naive patients uh, rather than pretreated um, renal cell and ometrial hepatocellular. Many of these are uh, with TKIs, and again, most of these are where TKIs have been uh, approved as single agents um, and not and then uh, have shown benefit with the combination, and then the bevacizumab, atezolizumab for hepatocellular carcinoma. Um, 
and again, we know that uh, pembrolizumab is an anti-PD-1 monoclonal antibody, ramsirumab is a VEGF receptor 2 monoclonal am antibody, and uh, there was preliminary data showing safety and efficacy with the combination of pembrolizumab and ramsirumab in a phase 1 trial across multiple tumor types, including non-small cell lung cancer. So based on this, we performed a phase, a randomized phase two trial, which was the S1800A done in the lung map uh, uh, platform. And um, this, these were patients who had had prior uh, immunotherapy and had at least uh, had at least benefited at least 84 days, and had at least pr had uh, platinum-based uh, doublet chemotherapy and had progression with ECOG performance status 0 1, and uh, they received either standard of care therapy or ramucirumab and pembrolizumab uh, on the experimental arm. And those standard of care were specified in this trial as docetaxel ramucirumab, docetaxel gemcitabine or pemetrexid for non-squamous, non-small cell lung cancer, and uh, the planned accrual was 130 patients. In this study, the bottom line showed that um, we, we, we saw an improvement in overall survival for ramucirumab and pembrolizumab with a hazard ratio of 0.69, and um, the median overall survival for the combination of ramucirumab and pembrolizumab was 14.5 months versus 11.6 months, so a significant benefit. And I think importantly, the majority of patients in this study had received docetaxel and ramucirumab as um, the combination with the highest response rate and survival in this setting. Um, so, and when we look at these subgroups, um, we found that all subgroups had hazard ratios of less than one. Um, PDL1 status did not uh, appear to uh, alter the outcome. There were more patients um, that had uh, overall survival benefit that had squamous cell um, uh, histology, and those who had received chemo followed by IO, potentially higher benefit. This is also in part just due to the timing of where patients were enrolled, that um, there were less patients getting frontline immunotherapy in the beginning of this study. Um, and then things like STK11 and KEEP1, we looked at these are very small numbers, but also seem to uh, benefit. So what about other, um, how about, how, what about the receptor tyrosine kinase inhibitors? And we have to remember that when we think about the TKIs for VEGF and VEGF2, that they are um, actually, uh, you know, multi-targeted and have, uh, have also block things like, like Axel and MET and, um, and F F FGFR. And uh, we know that, um, that we're getting a, a multitude of potential uh, immune modulators in addition to the VEGF modulation. So some of the the uh, data that is out there is uh, cabozantinib and uh, and atezolizumab and uh, the Cosmic 021 study again showing uh, responses about a, a, a little less than 30 percent response rate um, and progression free survival about four months um, with that combination and based on this there have been multiple uh, multiple uh, evaluations in uh, multiple patient populations but this was presented at ASCO um, in uh, in 2020 and uh, showed in patients who had um, refractory, highly refractory disease and highly pretreated disease that there were patients who had responses um, here in the uh, all patients. We had a, have a uh, disease control rate of about 65% and uh, progression free survival of 4.5 months. Um, and uh, this did not differ also by um, PDL1 status. So, um, and then the studies, the, the phase three studies that are ongoing, um, the contact O1 study, which is cabozantinib, atezolizumab versus docetaxel, we got a press release in uh, December um, of the three, with 366 patients enrolled, the overall survival endpoint was not met. There is a phase two study uh, randomized that is still recruiting and is more specific to the MET, um, RET, and ROS1 uh, population, so more selected uh, use of cabozantinib in combination. Nation. And uh, pembrolizumab and lumbatinib, a uh, highly, uh, uh, highly anticipated results uh, for this study. This combination is being used in the frontline setting um, and in subsequent line settings. The LEAP008 study is in the refractory setting. Um, again, a phase three study looking at about 400 patients, and uh, we do not have uh, data for, for this uh, study yet.
so the uh, citrovatinib and nivolumab study, this was actually uh, published and presented by Dr. Liel here. Um, but again, responses seen with the combination in early phase two data um, and uh, some patients with prolonged uh, progression-free time. Um, here the shows uh, citrovantamib and tizolizumab, um, another uh, PD-1 inhibitor, again, with uh, modest response rates, um, but overall survival in the 10-month range. So the SAFFIRE trial, uh, the phase three trial, looking at citrovantinib and nivolumab versus docetaxel again. Um, again, about 500 patients enrolled. So in May of 2023, we had uh, another press relief showing that the primary outcome of overall survival was not met for this study, and we await uh, that uh, presentation of the results. So the, uh, the Hudson trial that looked at multiple combinations with ICI in the pretreated population, um, looking at laparib, silicertib, um, and, uh, and the results showing here, um, looking specifically at the silicertib uh, combination, which showed the highest uh, progression-free and overall survival um, in patients. And this is moving on now to uh, the phase three Latify trial, which is ongoing. Um, and again, the uh, combination with a progression-free survival of five months and overall survival with uh, pro uh, an impressive 17 months. But again, these are single arms um, in, in multiple, uh, in multiply treated uh, patients uh, post IO. And so, and. Then moving forward, just uh, discussing our uh, S2302 Pragmatica Lung Trial. So this was, again, uh, a study that w grew out of the S1800A trial. And again, what we wanted to do was look at the one question of overall survival. So this did receive breakthrough approval by the FDA for the ramucirumab and pembrolizumab, but due to the um, smaller uh, phase two study, uh, most want additional data to move it forward into something that um, they would use as standard of care. In order to bring these two drugs together, um, we really needed a partnership with the FDA and CTEP um, that um, helped us to think more pragmatically about how to answer this question and, and hopefully answer this question quickly um, while it is still relevant. And so this is a large trial looking at uh, 700 patients and does not pre-prescribe the uh, standard of care arm. And um, it, it is really what, pay, what you would do in your standard practice. We're trying to empower investigators to do what they would normally do, um, but we do uh, lead them to the NCCN guidelines. And then arm B is the ramucirumab pembrolizumab, and we are simply looking at overall survival. So this helps us to ask this in a very pragmatic way and reduce the burden of data collection. So I think that's one of the most important parts of this study. And the secondary objectives are to look at high uh, grade unexpected adverse events. And so we expect that probably about 10% of the usual adverse event reporting will be required for this study. And so um, this study is mostly to just answer the, the overall survival question for ramucirumab and pembrolizumab to potentially make this uh, an a, a option for patients in the standard of care setting. So again, we want to empower investigators to treat patients as they would in the real world, decrease barriers to enrollment. There are very few eligibility um, criteria for this study and minimize the data collection. And um, just a, a example for the pragmatic stu study, um, we are focusing on stage, prior therapy, performance status, and safety for our eligibility. We enroll and treat patients as they would in the, the uh, real world with institutional guidelines and investigator discretion, and minimal items are collected. We don't collect labs, we don't collect imaging or rhesus, these are all done as standard of care. And again, the data capture, um, we have reduced the time points for data submission and the, reduced the number of forms. There are no CT uh, imaging or assessment forms, no lab uh, uh, forms that need to be filled out, no specimen collection. And again, the AEs, um, only high grade AEs that are related and unexpected. Um, and grade all grade five AEs. Um, so this is uh, re significantly reduced data. And so there's less data to monitor and audit um, in this study. 
so we're hoping that this will um, allow uh, sites to open the open trial and um, and again utilize their resources to enroll patients and not worry about some of the details that probably never even get looked at um, in the submissions and really focus on the idea of survival and high grade toxicities in these drugs that we know a lot about their safety and and efficacy. So I've got to say, wow, I did not know all that stuff about the Pragmatica study. That is super interesting. I, I want to hear a lot more about that. That is really cool. I want to start with you, Jacob. So two issues, at least from my point of view, that I'm curious to hear about is one is just what do you think about the strategy of, uh, you know, basically continuing in Pembro and adding in ramucirumab, where do you think it's heading? But also this really fascinating approach to the Pragmatica study. Any thoughts? Yeah, so to me it was surprising. I, I, the data was surprising. I would have anticipated, if I had to guess, more of a progression-free survival than overall survival benefit, and it was obviously the reverse, which I found uh, intriguing. The Pragmatica trial is, uh, is an exciting one in really revolutionizing the way that we're doing clinical trials, hopefully. I, I think uh, a lot of times our trials end up being held back by being so rigorous about enrollment criteria and all of this that we uh, end up enrolling really a different population than the average lung cancer patient. This is more relevant, particularly in small cell lung cancer, uh, where it's a more rapidly progressing disease. And then we require all these biopsies and these various other testings to be done prior to enrollment, which means that we're not enrolling patients with faster growing disease. To have a trial that really allows for uh, a more pragmatic approach uh, is, uh, is exciting, and, and it'll be really interesting to see what the experience is with that. So, Karen, I'd like to hear a little bit more about who's been involved in addition to you and, and, and where this idea came from. Is this all coming uh, out of the uh, cooperative groups? Is industry involved? Uh, and who's, where, was the, did the pandemic have anything to do with this? Can you kind of tell us a little bit more? I, I don't know whether other, I'm the last person to hear about this or not, but I just think it's really interesting. I'd love to hear more about why it's happening. Yes, thank you. I think that this was um, this grew out of again the S eighteen hundred A. We had a we had a combination of pembrolizumab and ramucirumab. That's two different um, industry partners um, in that combination, and um, and and drugs that are approved for many indications with well known toxicities. And the lung map port uh, the lung map platform has been highly integrated with um, the FDA and CTEP and Friends of Cancer Research and FNIH to run it. And so um, part of the um, mechanism um, has allowed some of our industry partners to potentially interact with the FDA about study design a little more fluidly. So um, it did come after the S1800A study, this came from a discussion with our industry partners and, um, and with the FDA and with CTEP saying, we want to do that phase three trial, but we understand that potentially the industry partners are not engaged enough to put what they would normally do into a phase three trial because these are two different companies with, uh, with, with drugs that are approved in multiple areas. So then it became a, a, a creative discussion and it was a lot of that was led by um, Rick Pasture at the FDA um, saying, how do we do this in a pragmatic way? And this was on the, on the on just on the edge of when both the FDA and the NCI were starting to talk about pragmatic designs and what that meant and so it really um, got these conversations going and I think the timing of it was really impe impeccable I'm not sure that it had to do with post-COVID but I think also interestingly we've all suffered from the um, great resignation and restructuring with the with with hybrid um, work um, for our, our research staff, and it's been a little bit of a struggle. And this, the, the sheer amount of data that needs to go into a database for a phase three registrational trial, and the amount of monitoring and auditing and all those things, and the burden on our staff is huge. And so to run a trial like that is not a small thing. So to take away all of those layers and say, we know that there's a survival benefit in this phase two trial, we're only gonna answer that one question. We know the safety of these drugs. They've been used in 
thousands and thousands of patients across multiple diseases, and we're going to cut back all of the excess, and we're going to just get to those questions. And that was the basis of it, and the support kind of started to grow around that idea. So interesting. Uh, Corey, I'm curious about your thoughts on that. Also, lung map. You know, I was flashing on the old battle study that started at, I think it was MD Anderson, where they, that's, to me, that was the first example. Now you see it throughout oncology. Any comments, uh, again, on what, you know, how they've been approaching it with this Pragmatica? And also, Corey, you know, I always view you as the eternal skeptic. What do you think about uh, the strategy? You think it's in a couple years that's what we're going to be doing, or even before then? I hope it's what we're going to be doing, at least a new. Uh, a new standard of care. Uh, so lung map was uh, actually uh, spawned in part by the battle study from MD Anderson and as best I can determine it's going to be immortal. It started out as a study looking at uh, biomarker and uh, biomarker nonspecific uh, agents in second line squamous cell and now has morphed into basically second line all comers regardless of histology. We have separate um, molecular uh, components of the study. It's multiple studies under one rubric, so a single uh, IRB approval without having to uh, get separate uh, uh, trials approved uh, for the wild-type population that do not have molecular markers. Uh, a number of studies have been done under that rubric, and Karen's, frankly, has been the most successful to date. It's the only one that uh, generated positive data, but it was a joint partnership, as she's pointed out, between industry CTEP cooperative groups and uh, um, uh, community oncologists and also by the FDA uh, ultimately uh, generating Pragmatica. Pragmatica is high risk but high reward. Uh, she, both Jacob and Karen have pointed out all the benefits of doing this, the uh, cutting down on expense, cutting down on the sheer volume of paperwork, on the, um, the headaches that are involved with this, on all the audits and uh, uh, other problems that go into clinical trials. My biggest concern is the inclusion of PS2 and PS3 patients who will no doubt go on. And I worry that while we will see a benefit, I hope we'll see a benefit in zero and one, I have yet to see drugs approved, at least in non-small cell lung cancer on the basis of data in PS2 and PS3 and that they may otherwise dilute a uh, otherwise positive trial. And I've spoken to Mary Redmond actually about this to make sure hopefully that doesn't happen, that uh, it's properly powered for the zero and ones. Finally, uh, this is uh, uh, revolutionary. It's uh, setting the stage. We have trials now in locally advanced uh, looking at stereotactic radiation plus concurrent media uh, chemo radiation for mediastinal disease versus our standard uh, approach. Uh, adopting the same rules, eliminating uh, uh, unnecessary uh, blood draws, uh, tissue biopsies, getting rid of all the timeline rules that exist, uh, the 60-day rule for prior scans, um, and then uh, addressing the point of combining immunotherapy with the angiogenesis inhibitors. Got to go back to the OAK trial at Tezo uh, when it was done beyond progression uh, versus docetaxel actually in a retrospective analysis did show a survival advantage versus other agents. And in Power 150, when we see a separation of the curves for the combination of BEV, Atezo, and chemo, that separation actually increases over time once the chemo stopped. I am convinced there is at least p some potential synergy here between uh, monoclonals targeting angiogenesis and checkpoint inhibitors. Really interesting. Final comment from Tiziana. You know, the reason I brought up COVID is I remember in the beginning of COVID, the pre-vaccine year, and you know, people were wondering whether you actually were going to be able to do clinical research. Where are they? Where are you going? You know, how are you going to bring telemedicine in? Will clinical research actually be able to continue? And of course, mm -hmm. uh, that was a, that was actually achieved. But I think to me, it also was you know, kind of taking a look at how we take care of patients, where does telemedicine fit in, and how we do clinical research. And I, I'm thrilled to hear about this uh, effort with Pragmatica. Any uh, comments, Tiziana? Yeah, I, I mean, I think COVID changed our lives forever, right? We took a big hit, lots of centers shut down, lots of people changed fields, and then we had to kind of come back and innovate and strategize and think about how we can be creative so that we can 
sort of foresee challenges that we never thought we would have to deal with before. So I do think that if anything good came out of COVID is that like we weathered the storm, we made it through and we became more creative. And the telemedicine thing, I think was something that a lot of us weren't accustomed to doing, but now we know that that can be a strategy that can bring you know, care to patients. We can reach more people, we can meet people where they're at. And if we can integrate that with clinical trials in a way that's safe for patients, and it brings therapies to patients, I think that is a win. You know, and now we're doing, you know, virtual consults globally. So I think telemedicine is a big win. I think these creative efforts and being more pragmatic and being more real world to really include patients and include diverse patient population, that's another big thing that I think trials like Pragmatica are gonna allow. If we create strategies and eligibility criteria that is more open to real world patients, we're gonna have a more diverse population. And that I think is also gonna be a big win. So uh, one more other outcome of COVID is it certainly had a big effect on uh, continuing medical education. I mean, think about what we're doing here today. I mean, it's, it's amazing that we could just sit down, do this, pop it out, and people are going to start using it in a, in a couple of days. I mean, amazing, and goes even beyond that. All right, well, let's continue. Uh, we were talking about how ADCs are really changing the face of oncology, and Jacob's going to talk about Trope 2 and other novel antibody drug conjugates uh, in non-small cells. So we're going to focus a lot on trope 2 because really, uh, particularly for the non-actionable alterations, that, that really is the up and coming. Um, I'll just point out, though, we do have patritumab, deruxtecan, and HER3. This is post-EGFR progression. There's also, of course, as mentioned earlier, uh, trastuzumab, deruxtecan for HER2 mutations. I'm not really going to touch on those so much, uh, and, and so I call them out at the beginning. Um, as I said, we're going to focus a bit more on, uh, on trope two. So uh, first of all, what is trope two? Uh, frankly, there's still a lot for us to learn about, about this. Um, this is something that generally seems to be on uh, tumor cells, not really in normal tissue. So uh, these are obviously important factors when thinking of targeting something for cancer treatment, the fact that it's on the tumors and not in the normal tissue. It is thought to be a poor prognostic indicator. Um, there are different data sets on this, but more of them point to poor prognosis from it. And it is thought to be an oncogene that leads to um, initiating signaling mechanisms that increase tumorigenicity, aggressiveness, metastasis. So essentially being a driver that uh, a poor prognosis, this all fits together. Now, uh, antibody drug conjugates in general have three components. There's the antibody, there is the linker that then binds to the payload, which is generally some form of chemotherapy. Uh, first of all, sasituzumab govotecan was really the first for a trope 2 antibody drug conjugate. Uh, you can see this was published in 2017 in JCO. And then in lung cancer, this demonstrated a response rate of 19%, uh, median response of about six months. Now, clinical benefit being uh, incorporating stable disease as well. I know Corey had, uh, in some of the data he reported out, also showed a disease control rate. We increasingly see this. Uh, and I'll admit, in non-small cell lung cancer, I'm not always sure what to make of a disease control rate, stable disease itself. You know, there may be some patients that truly benefit, uh, but, uh, but generally it's not going to be all of them, certainly. Um, in small cell lung cancer, which is so rapidly progressive, I, I give a little more stock to, uh, to stable disease, uh, but um, uh, that did show 43% uh, clinical benefit rate. Now, um, specifically about datapotamab deruxed cancer, so this is a, another trope 2 antibody drug conjugate that really has uh, a lot of ongoing studies and, and one um, that we'll mention that is awaiting uh, reporting out. Um, this drug, uh, trope 2, is how it binds to the cell, and you can see there on the left side is where it binds, it's pulled in, and then in the lysosome is where the payload is, is then cleaved from uh, the ADC, and that's where it then has its effect. Now, datapotamab deruxed can has as deruxtecan as its payload, this is a top a topoisomerase 1 inhibitor, uh, leads to cell death, which then releases all this payload into the surrounding tissues, and it does have what's called a bystander effect, meaning that it, it's membrane permeable and therefore crosses into surrounding cells uh, and then can lead to cell death uh, within those surrounding cells as well. 
On the right there, you see the initial uh, dosing from the phase one, so started at 0.27 milligrams per kilogram up to 10, uh, which was uh, a, a bit toxic because of mucositis and skin in particular. So we're going to look at four, six, and eight milligram per kilogram dosing. Uh, and this was initially reported uh, at World Lung in 2021. And you can see here the different dosing cohorts. And here's the baseline characteristics. This was enrolled in the United States and Japan in squamous and non-squamous. Um, you can see there in the previous lines of therapy, it has uh, a different lines. And you'll notice in there is TKIs and that a percentage of patients had EGFR mutations. Uh, EGFR was, was not the only actionable alteration. Uh, these patients had previously been treated uh, in all cases. So uh, and whether they had actionable alterations or not, all patients were or had previously been treated, uh, and this is later progression. Um, but it did include across all cohorts. And this is just recently reported out, this was in the JCO this year, looking at these different dose levels, you can see the four, six, and eight milligram per kilogram cohorts, uh, the waterfall plot really showing the majority of patients having some degree of tumor shrinkage. And there um, in the spider plot, you can see that there's really some durability to many of these responses. Uh, now the overall response rate uh, is around 30% across the cohorts. Uh, and then the um, duration of response you can see is really, I'd say a surprising 10 to 12 month duration of responses. And so there really is an indicator of durability to those. Uh, the progression free and overall survival are also listed there. Uh, this of course was a single arm trial, so we don't have a comparator, uh, but these are, are, are quite compelling results. Now, on the left side there is from that same publication this year, uh, looking at the toxicity profile. And on the right there, it, it, this is from when it was previously reported out at World Lung, and, and the final publication has similar numbers. And I just like that figure as far as a way of being able to visualize the toxicity profile. Uh, some of the things to point out on here, uh, well, first of all, uh, notice that it's the notched uh, portion of those bars on the right graph that are really the grade three and beyond. And so there was fairly minimal uh, as far as the grade three and beyond toxicities. But some to point out, there is the stomatitis there on the second bar from the top. Uh, this is something that although the majority are grade one, two, um, if that's ongoing, uh, that is uh, a problem. I think stomatitis is one that really can be a, a big hit to one's quality of life even when, uh, even when it's lower grade, if it's ongoing. Alopecia, we discussed before with another case, and not everybody really seems to get this, but some patients do really get pretty, uh, they get full alopecia. Um, the uh, other thing, dry eye, uh, as mentioned in the case, uh, is on there as well. This is not usually a severe problem, but it also is something that really requires ophthalmology involvement. Uh, and so that's uh, in, in something to be aware of. Mucosal inflammation, as there mentioned on there, uh, kind of goes along with the stomatitis. Now, this has also been looked at in combination with pembrolizumab. Uh, this is uh, the Tropian Lung 02. And you can see there, there were six cohorts, the first two um, being just with pembro, and then cohort three to six also involving platinum uh, therapy. Um, the, uh, initially, this was enrolling in second line, uh, and then in kind of midway through cohort two, started enrolling in the first line setting. Uh, cohort three to six, also some of those were, were later lines. On the top right there is the preclinical work that really shows that the combination of dato DXD along with an anti-PD-1 or pd one inhibitor uh, looks to perform better than either of those individually. So in, in the Tropian Lung 2 data, here we see it included adenocarcinoma as well as squamous. On the bottom there, you see that the majority really were, were first-line therapy, but there were some that were second-line and beyond. 
And that data was reported out at ASCO this year, and these are from those slides uh, in the presentation. You can see the waterfall plots look particularly good. Again, uh, you know, on the right side there, that's the first line setting. Uh, on the left there, all patients, so many of those were also first line, uh, but we do see really the, the, the vast majority of patients having some degree of tumor shrinkage. And here are the spider plots really showing uh, the, um, the durability of many of these as well. And this is a data set that is still maturing, but there's really a very strong indication here of, um, uh, of efficacy from those results. The toxicity profile, again, this is from the slides presented at ASCO. And, um, generally pretty well tolerated. I will focus on, on a couple of, uh, of them. Again, you see the stomatitis there at the top. Uh, and so that really is an ongoing area for just being aware of when treating patients with data DXD. Uh, that, and, and that has, uh, in some cases, um, really improved with dose reduction. I, I found that in patients where I couldn't control it with things like a steroid rinse, um, or even ice chips during infusion, just keeping mouth cold, kind of like what we, uh, there, there are those caps to really help prevent alopecia, for example, uh, using that similar concept with the ice chips at the time of infusion. Um, and there is ongoing study really looking at better controlling stomatitis while on D date of DXD. Of course, the other thing is ILD, and, and so we'll talk a bit more about this one. Um, you can see across both trials on the left there is from the presentation at ASCO, and on the right there is from the publication uh, from the uh, Tropion Lung 01 study. So left being including PEMBRO or, or PEMBRO and chemo on the right is just the data DXD by itself. You know, ILD... Um, there is an adjudication committee. Of course, uh, they're getting all the data from uh, the cases as well. It's a challenging thing to define in these patients because in, in um, I, I'm not sure that there are any cases really where there is pathologically confirmed ILD. And so we're seeing scans that show some inflammatory looking findings, which of course we call ILD. And in patients with lung cancer having some shortness of breath as well, then that all of a sudden becomes a grade two if there's any suspicion of that being drug related. Um, certainly we are seeing more of that in these trials uh, across the board than what we would expect. Uh, I worry a bit that as we become increasingly aware and attentive to the, to the potential for ILD, that we may then start calling everything ILD. And of course, we see uh, patients where they have some incidental inflammatory looking findings. Someone who is on docetaxel, for example, can have these inflammatory looking findings that we, we say, well, we'll just uh, follow, follow and see what that shows. And with time, sometimes these uh, kind of wax and wane. Um, so I think there's still a lot of work to do, not just in better defining the uh, potential etiology around um, the ILD in this case, but, but actually even a more detailed uh, description of the actual incidents. Uh, there are multiple trials ongoing. The first, Dato DXD versus docetaxel, is the one that has reported out progression-free survival benefit. The overall survival data is still maturing. Um, I, I put a little graphic there for Lung07 because that's a three-arm, and so to be able to look at that uh, more quickly. Uh, but just to say that there are multiple still studies still ongoing in actionable and, uh, and, and wild type, as Corey had described it. Now, CCAM5 is another uh, um, where there's an antibody drug con conjugate um, uh, targeting this. Uh, this is about 20% of lung adenocarcinoma. Uh, Tusimidumab of raftancine binds to this. Um, their data for this looked at moderate as well as high expressors. And really, it's just the high expressors that have about a 20% response rate. You can see in moderate expressors, it was only about 7%. Certainly, some durability you see uh, in the swimmer's plot there, uh, many who kind of fall in that moderate range. And this is where, again, that, that disease control rate you see is 64 and 60% across. Uh, but I think in this case, we're really looking more at the overall uh, response rate uh, with some portion of those really having some durability. There are multiple trials uh, further with this tusimidumab raftancine in combination with chemo, immunotherapy, uh, and in other disease settings. 
The one toxicity to point out to this is the keratitis, and this is something that does tend to improve with holding the drug. So it, it does look like it's uh, easier to uh, control. So uh, really a lot to talk about there. I'm kind of curious, uh, Karen, uh, what are you thinking you're going to be using for uh, second-line therapy, uh, assuming the data <laughs> looks as promising as it sounds like? And also, I'm kind of curious about, I don't know how often you get the third-line therapy. I imagine not too uh, infrequently uh, how it might affect third-line therapy. What are you thinking at this point, Karen? Yeah, so I think of it more as subsequent therapy versus lines because there are also are those patients who might get, um, you know, uh, like uh, Corey's patient who got Pembro and then uh, and then Carbo Pem Pembro, and so it's it's different to think about lines versus um, what they've received before and what makes most sense in their course of their disease. So it, it is a little bit more like a chronic disease than, uh, than it used to be, even in, for patients who don't have actionable mutations. But I, I think ADCs are going to be part of this. Um, I think it, 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 the, the challenge to move it up to frontline with the toxicities, I, I think that might take a little longer, but I think we will be util, utilizing this in second line and beyond for our patients. And it, it may not be instead of, it may be in addition to. And so I think it, it provides, uh, these drugs provide um, more options for our patients. And uh, it really is understanding the toxicities and um, these these kind of off-target toxicities that may be related to where the drug is being um, released, um, maybe early or things like that, like the ILD, and, uh, and, and trying to make sure that we have as safe uh, of molecules as we possibly can have. So I think that's kind of where that the field is going to continue to move is trying to make these safer and safer and, and uh, more uh, get the efficacy to the target. I guess the thing I was wondering about is I'm kind of curious if you kind of start out with a, a carbopem uh, pembro uh, and um, let's say you decide you're going to use a data second line after you see the data, do you think you would can use docetaxel or docetaxel or ambucirumab third line? I, I definitely would. If, if the patient was somebody who could still tolerate um, that type of therapy, I definitely would continue to use the tools in our toolbox and just move it to the subsequent line. Corey, any uh, comments on this uh, fascinating agent? Also, the idea of using it first line. I mean, the idea of chemo plus IO, obviously, you all really established the beachhead for that, but it's being used in so many other cancers, but also IO plus uh, ADC is a very common regimen, first-line therapy, diffuse large B-cell, Hodgkin lymphoma, I mean, there's a bunch of a bladder cancer I was just talking about. Uh, any thoughts about the, this agent in the second line and the maybe in the future first-line, Corey? So going to the first-line question, I think that's a much higher bar. Um, we already have established regimens there. Uh, the results uh, with 10 percent up to 30 percent five-year survival now with various uh, with IO based strategies uh, is going to be hard to uh, exceed um, and then the toxicity issues of combining this particularly with chemo I think the IO ADC uh, combination is probably a bit better tolerated um, this is very much like chemo the side effect profiles of the ADCs are essentially chemo with added side effects such as ILD or the ocular toxicities, um, uh, toxicities that we typically have not dealt with uh, so much in the past. So the challenges there are great. But as Karen pointed out, uh, we use the term second line, there's really subsequent line. Uh, there are separate second line trials. The uh, uh, Presumably the approval if it meets its OS uh, benefit, and I think it'll probably need that. Um, we've already seen the PFS uh, benefit. Uh, is uh, quite tantalizing. The, uh, you look at the data that uh, Jacob showed, the median survival for the uh, phase one, phase two was about 11 months. The PFS was about five months. That looks very similar to docetaxelramide, but you got to remember in that trial, the median number of prior regimens was three. 50% had received three prior regimens. So this was really fourth or fifth line treatment for a number of individuals, and it was still generating data that good. So once we see the numbers from PFS and hopefully OS, I think uh, uh, skeptics will be uh, convinced. 
Um, I'm still very worried about the ILD. Any grade is 20%. Uh, granted, grade three was about three or 4%, but uh, uh, our comfort level dealing with uh, unusual side effects is uh, marginal. Speaking of skeptics, I got to ask you, it's off topic, but I'm kind of curious, uh, Corey, were you surprised at the survival benefit with the Dora? We were all wondering whether it was even going to be there. I think people were even wondering whether it was going to even be there, let alone what it was. I was curious. I'm not surprised there think? was a survival benefit, but I am survived, uh, surprised by the magnitude of the benefit. Yes, I exactly. I think a survival, as to, a survival curves uh, showing benefit is either uh, banana shape, where you see a bulge in the median and then they join over time, or fishtail shape, where it uh, separates and then it separates more. And in fact, at least so far, and we don't have longer term follow, but in five years, it looks like a fishtail uh, curve. So um, raising the question of whether these drugs are really cytal and not just static. So uh, remember, the, 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 by and large, people on Adora were off uh, treatment at that point. This was two years beyond the conclusion of treatment. We're still seeing a survival benefit. So I think uh, uh, any skeptics have been convinced at this point. Yeah, I was telling Professor Long in a melanoma program about the Adora data because they have the same kind of question with adjuvant uh, BRAF um, uh, therapy. Uh, final comment from uh, Tiziana. I'm curious about, uh, Jacob was so eloquent and you know, really verbalizing the, the issue of ILD in lung cancer. You know, when we talk, for example, TDXD and breast cancer, uh, GI cancer, you know, these people don't have prior lung disease and their, their only discussion is how often they need to do screening for ILD, which they do do pretty aggressively, particularly in breast cancer. But of course, lung cancer is a completely different uh, story in terms of ILD. Any thoughts about how much of an issue this is going to be with DATO, uh, and for that matter, even TDXD, Tiziana? Yeah. And you know, I think it's really important to work in a multidisciplinary team. I think increasingly, we need to understand what's really going on and getting more bronchoscopies and getting more specialized opinions from pulmonology and interventional pulmonology and radiology about a differential diagnosis. You know, there are things that can mimic ILD and not be ILD. I definitely agree with Jacob that we need more detailed workups. We need more integration of our specialists in the multi-D team to get us a better understanding of what's really going on. I think we are accustomed to treating immune-mediated pneumonitis. Obviously, we've done this for a long time. These are a little bit different. Um, I think it does generate concern, but I think with more experience and integration of a multi-D approach to managing and diagnosing, is this really ILD is going to be key to move forward. Jacob, uh, any final thoughts about these trials in the first line, uh, and how do you think that's going to play out over time? How much of an issue do you think ILD is going to end up being for DATO? Well, to Corey's point that these antibody drug conjugates really are like chemotherapy, I'd say I agree halfway, where there is certainly overlap of what we see within chemotherapy. I think as far as fatigue, uh, that's generally quite a bit better. Um, so it's not quite like platinum chemo, but it's also not quite like pemetrexed, which is really quite easy on people, but maybe somewhere in between. There are some people that just do exceptionally well, like the case that I had uh, of a patient, 21 months continuing his career continuing uh, doing everything you know all of his all of his normal daily life while on the therapy uh, that's not typical of something like platinum based chemo um, but it also you know this is not immunotherapy where most patients end up having no toxicities so it is somewhere in between them but certainly to the point that there is a unique toxicity profile that one needs to kind of become more accustomed to the eye toxicity the mucositis and the ILD the ILD D, it's such a tough thing because it's important for everyone to be aware of it, yet it's also really important for people to not just immediately conclude that that, in fact, is what is going on. And so to Tiziana's point, doing these workups are really important. Uh, and there's a window there where if someone's not really having any symptoms, you don't want to put them through a bronchoscopy. When they get to the point where symptoms are severe, you can no longer do it. So where is that sweet spot where you might actually get some kind of diagnostic workup that can help. And I think it's really important for clinicians to be very focused on making sure they're getting workup instead of just coming to a conclusion that it's from the drug. 
So just to clarify in terms of, quote, not being able to do it, and I've noticed a little bit of a disparity between, for example, the breast investigators and, uh, for example, the pulmonary investigators, even GI investigators. The breast investigators, if you get sympt any symptoms of ILD, you're not getting TDXD again, and then probably I would say the same thing for other uh, similar uh, ADCs. But in lung, Jacob, I don't quite find that, and maybe you all are so used to dealing with the compromised pulmonary function that you're willing to, you know, maybe take risks that the breast people won't. But if you have somebody who has symptomatic ILD, will you restart therapy if, after they resolve? Well, the tough thing is who's having symptomatic ILD. Uh, our patients tend to have respiratory symptoms that can kind of come and go to some extent. I think if you have somebody who has very clear uh, signs within their lungs, in inflammatory findings throughout their lungs, and very clear symptoms, that's one thing. And that's what I think people tend to picture when talking about somebody with symptomatic ILD. But there is a much more subtle uh, potential there as well, where we see these kind of waxing and waning inflammatory findings in patients, and many of our patients kind of have baseline respiratory symptoms or sometimes have a bit more cough. Is that from ILD? Is that actually real? Is this from the drug? There's a real question about a lot of these cases, and that's the space where I think we have to be particularly attentive to just not come to some conclusion. At the same time, you know, as, as, as our radiologists become more aware of this, and so they see that this patient is on this drug, they see something in the lungs that maybe historically they would say, oh, there's a subtle inflammatory finding to follow up later. Now we're going to see in reports a drug-related ILD, and, and that's not necessarily a radiology call in some of those cases. Uh, and so, you know, being attentive to the possibility of this while also being attentive to not just coming to the conclusion that all of these are drug-related ILD. I think that's going to be that challenging space to kind of work with two potential truths. So uh, we're going to move on now, and uh, Tiziana is going to present uh, other promising therapeutic strategies, but particularly which she just presented at ASCO. I think it was one of the most anticipated presentations. That the, certainly, I was really curious to see it when I saw the press release. I think everybody else was similarly curious and also to see where this is heading. Uh, so, Tiziana, can you review the data? Definitely, thanks. And thanks for that call out for our ASCO presentation. So, here are the learning objectives. I'll briefly talk to you about mechanism of action of TT fields and why this is a strategy that we decided to investigate in the lunar trial for patients with non-small cell lung cancer, some practical considerations, future directions, and then briefly touch upon other strategies in, I'll talk about subsequent lines of therapies as we've discussed in all the prior presentations. So tumor treating fields, this is a new way of thinking about treating cancers in general. Tumor treating fields have been investigated in other tumor types, and really what tumor treating fields does is these are alternating electric fields that are tuned to a specific frequency, and I'll show you preclinical data on how this was developed in non-small cell lung cancer that basically disrupt mitosis, and within that, this leads to aneuploidy, endoplasmic reticulum stress, and downstream effects of that also include immunogenic cell death. So a multimodal mechanism of action of how this can be an anti-cancer strategy. So tumor treating fields as it affect mitosis, let's think about sort of the basics of the physics of electric fields. So just to kind of go back to the basics, an electric field is a field of electric forces that surround any charged source. So whether that source is positive, negative, or a dipole. And basically what we can see is that in a constant field, these charged particles will move in the direction of the opposite polarity. With the use of alternating um, electric fields, what we're seeing is the charges will move back and forth, and these dipoles will rotate, and this disrupts mitosis, not only in metaphase, but also in telophase. And so here's where we're at. You know, here's tumor treating fields. This has actually been already approved in two other disease types, FDA approved for newly diagnosed glioblastoma, as well as recurrent glioblastoma. This has now been FDA approved since 2011 based on randomized phase three trials demonstrating an improved overall survival. 
And then we also saw the approval of this with the device exemption approval by the FDA in a single arm phase two study in malignant pleural mesothelioma. So preclinical data has shown that these frequencies are actually based on cancer cell histologies and specifically for non-small cell lung cancer, the optimal frequency has been established at 150 kilohertz. And here's the preclinical data to show that. Basically what they've done is frequency dependent effects of these TT fields and preclinical models demonstrating decreased cell viability is most effective at this 150 kilohertz. We've also demonstrated preclinically the use of tumor treating fields with chemotherapy, specifically taxanes in non-small cell lung cancer cell lines, showing that the addition of tumor treating fields to paclitaxel led to a decrease in the number of viable cells. And we've also shown that the addition of tumor treating fields has actually led to immunogenic cell death in non-small cell lung cancer cell lines, and this is shown in this graph, including showing so, some markers of apoptosis um, and immunogenic cell death in the middle and on the right. With the use of tumor treating fields and anti-PD-1 immunotherapy, we've also seen in preclinical models that when you add tumor treating fields to anti-PD-1 immunotherapy, you see again, decreased tumor viability in the combination of tumor treating fields plus anti-PD-1, PD-L1 versus each modality alone or control. So but prior studies have also shown the um, feasibility of using tumor treating fields in patients with non-small cell lung cancer. This is EF15, which was a phase one, two trial that investigated the use of tumor treating fields in combination with pemetrexid in patients with previously treated non-small cell lung cancer. And here the primary endpoint of this study was a device-related toxicity, as well as time to infield progression. This was a single um, single uh, country study. This was all conducted in Switzerland. There are four sites that were involved in this study. And what it showed was that the application of tumor treaty fields plus pemetrexid in patients with pretreated non-small cell lung cancer after pl prior platinum-based chemotherapy was feasible. It was safe. The median overall survival here with the addition of tumor treating fields plus pemetrexid was 13.8 months, which compared favorably in this population of patients in the second line who received pemetrexid at that time. The median time to infield tumor uh, progression was 6.5 months, and the median time to systemic progression, or PFS, was 5.2 months. And this is sort of um, an important distinction here on the left, is the time to tumor progression. A little bit of what we were talking about in terms of, is this a local effect, or is this a systemic effect? And on what, the, what you're seeing on the left is the time to progression infield versus systemic. And as you can see there, there really isn't a significant difference in this study between the time to progression, both infield as well as systemic progression. So again, this was all the basis and the rationale for the next study, which was the lunar phase three study, which was a pivotal study, randomized phase three to evaluate the safety and efficacy of tumor treating fields therapy with standard of care, compared to standard of care alone in patients with metastatic non-small cell lung cancer who had progression on prior platinum-based chemotherapy. So here you see 276 patients who got randomized one-to-one -to, -one to tumor treating fields therapy, which um, then was combined with the systemic therapy of choice of the investigator, which could be immunotherapy versus standard docetaxel versus the standard of care alone. This study was conducted prior to approval of immunotherapy in frontline. And what our study showed, and this was the primary endpoint, was that the addition of tumor treating fields to standard of care systemic therapy in this patient population in the second line and beyond after platinum-based chemotherapy led to improvement in overall survival in the ITT population. You see here the median overall survival of 9.9 .9 months versus 13.2 months with a hazard ratio of 0.4. Secondary endpoints included the overall survival in the ICI treated patients. And as you can see here, there was a striking difference um, that was meaningful in this subgroup of patients with the median overall survival of 10.8 um, months versus 18.5 months with a hazard ratio of 0 0.63. In the population treated with docetaxel, you see here, there was a numerical improvement in overall survival that did not meet statistical significance with a hazard ratio of 0 0.81. 
In terms of safety and tolerability overall, in terms of all grades, what we saw was that there, there was more dermatitis in the treatment fields plus standard of care. We're seeing here all grades 42% versus 2%. However, the majority of these were grade one and two in nature, and the high grade toxicities were actually quite low at 2%. So again, no difference in systemic toxicities, no differences in pneumonitis or other immune-related AEs, and there were quality of life measures that were evaluated in this study. And the detailed analysis is ongoing, but the data that we have so far is that there were no notable differences in health-related quality of life when you added tumor treating fields to standard of care. And so here's a breakdown for the tumor treating field adverse device effects. The median um, usage of the, the device was 15 weeks with immune checkpoint inhibitor and 13 weeks with docetaxel. And again, as stated, majority of these uh, device-related effects were actually low-grade in nature, one and two. Again, most notably dermatitis. The majority of the cases resolved in 87% of the cases. And as I stated in our case discussion, you know, the management of this is really actually quite simple and obviously there are things that you can do to sort of preemptively sort of identify patients who might be higher risk and be proactive about managing patients and advising them on when to call the clinic if they are having dermatitis or other skin related concerns. The majority of the dermatitis cases resolved with a median duration of three weeks. There were no grade four toxicities and no grade five toxicities that were attributable to tumor treat treating fields therapy. And so here is the basic outline of what we used and what we can use in clinical practice if this does get approved by the FDA, really being proactive and assessing for risk factors for any skin-related conditions and whether they are using other therapies that may impact you know, skin-related skin conditions. Um, ensure that the skin is clean and dry, well-shaved um, prior to using the array application. And then you do have to replace these arrays every three to four days and reposition them about two centimeters meters to an alternate layout. And this really does reduce the chances of developing dermatitis in my experience. Um, importantly though, if patients do develop dermatitis, you, you can monitor, use topical uh, steroids, use topical antibiotics if there are signs of folliculitis or infection. And then certainly if needed, hold the tumor treating fields, remove the adhesive bandages, um, give a break of two to seven days. And then when things improve, you can certainly apply the arrays back on using the principles in the prevent and minimizing precautions. So this is a slide. Um, the pictures are not mine and these are not my patients. This was actually provided to me by the company. But we were talking about the clinical applications of how we roll this out and what our experience was on trial. Of course, it was an experience that was on a clinical trial population, but really the way that this goes is, you know, if there is a patient that is identified as a good candidate for tumor treating fields therapy by the clinician, the clinician will then prescribe tumor treating fields therapy. And then what happens is the company actually troubleshoots and delivers and supports the patient and their family, including education of the patient and the caregiver about how to use the device, when to call, and they're available 24 seven for support. So the arrays are actually changed at home by the patient and their caregiver. Again, we talked about that time interval of three to four days, and then patients continue to come to clinic, they get their systemic therapy with their treating oncologist and continue to work with clinic in managing any side effects from the systemic therapy, and certainly if they have any side effects from um, the tumor treating fields. And as we talked about here, like, how does it work? You know, this is a portable medical device. The treatment is local regional. You've got adhesive bandages on the chest, and then patients are connected to this portable device that has a battery pack. And you see there's a little cord there, and patients have to carry a backpack, a purse, um, to kind of take the device with them. And as the technology has evolved, even in the study, the actual battery pack in the device actually was smaller, which I think is more comfortable for patients. But shifting gears about what other strategies I think may be relevant as we talk about what we do in clinic is thinking about in patients who had prior immunotherapy, who benefited from prior immunotherapy, is there any evidence or data about using immunotherapy post-progression? And we talked about this in our prior talks. This is the OAK study, which is a randomized phase three study, stud, study that established the role of atezolizumab versus docetaxel in patients previously, pre previously treated. And here what they did was patients who were on the study, who had progression of their disease, 
This is a non-randomized study. They could continue on immunotherapy with atezolizumab beyond progression. And then the other cohort that you see here is the docetaxel arm. And what we're seeing here is that the treatment with PD-1, PD-L1 block, uh, PD-1, PD-L1 blockade post-progression actually led to improved outcomes in this non-randomized cohort of patients using the uh, OAK trial data. And it was actually quite meaningful when you looked at the study. The overall survival for the population post-progression in the Atezo arm was 12.7 months. In the docetaxel arm, it was 8.7 months. And then when you look to the patients that actually got no treatment, the overall survival was 2.2 months. And you can see the curves here in this non-randomized retrospective analysis really does demonstrate that perhaps post-progression, there is a subset of patients who benefit from continuing on immunotherapy. In addition, they also demonstrated that about half of the patients actually had stable disease post-progression on a Tezo, and about 7% of patients actually went on to have a response post-progression on a tezolizumab um, post-progression. So I think while this is not an approved strategy, I think a lot of clinicians do perhaps use this strategy, and I think we need to better understand who are the patients who will continue to benefit post-progression on single-agent immunotherapy to prevent toxicities and perhaps have continued benefit. And I think Corey also outlined very well potential pathways and ways that we can overcome resistance to PD-1, PD-L1 inhibitors. This is um, an outline of all the different efforts, including use of other novel immune checkpoints, other novel strategies, including the VEGF. And I think as we develop new strategies, thinking about biomarkers, um, not only of benefit, but also of resistance are going to be key. And then lastly, just commenting on early integration of palliative care. We talked about how our patients have so many needs beyond you know, tumor control. Um, there are so many other needs in terms of sim symptom control, managing not only you know, their emotional well-being, their physical well-being, and how they continue to lead their lives as best as possible as we improve strategies that hopefully can continue to lead to longer survival. So this was a study that we've mentioned before, the Temel study that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine. This is now in 2010. And I think this was a really well-designed, impressive study that demonstrated the benefits of this early integration of palliative care services. So in patients with advanced non-small cell lung cancer, early integration of palliative care, in addition to sort of the usual oncology care was actually significantly superior to not only improving quality of life, mood, but also importantly, patients having less aggressive therapies at the end of their life, but importantly, with improved survival. So I think integrating palliative care in the clinics with oncology is definitely another really important strategy that may be a very meaningful thing to improved outcomes for our patients. So in conclusion, immunotherapy resistance in the setting of recurrent or metastatic non-small cell lung cancer is heterogeneous, better therapies are needed. We demonstrated in our study that tumor treating fields therapy with standard of care led to improved survival with no added systemic toxicities. We are investigating the use of tumor treating fields now with current standard of care, specifically immunotherapy in the front line, as well as in patients with locally advanced non-small cell lung cancer following chemoradiation and early palliative care leads to longer survival and should be integrated early. So uh, th Thank thanks so much. Uh, I love that slide with the mechanisms. That's one of my favorite slides uh, that you put up there from your paper. So I would like to give uh, Corey, Karen, and uh, Jacob a, a chance to comment or ask any questions. But first, let me start with my question, which is uh, the obvious one. Why do you see such a difference in the IO arm versus the docetaxel arm, and who were those patients in the IO arm who didn't get it first line? How many of them were people with relative contraindications? Was it people who couldn't access it because of where they live? Any thoughts about that? Yeah, and that's a great question. And one of the things that I think this study really was designed prior to the use of IO in frontline and literally mid-study you know, the standard of care changed where immunotherapy then was used in the front line. So I think that's the main reason of what you're seeing. With the data that we have, you know, the, base, the baseline demographics and the PDL1 data that was available was 
not different between the subgroups, including the subgroups that receive tumor treating fields, but 58% of the patients in the tumor treating fields uh, plus docetaxel group received a prior ICI versus 2% in the tumor treating fields plus ICI group. So the majority of these patients really were patients that were IO naive. Um, and that was in part, I think, because of the shifting paradigm of moving IO in the front line. And this was a global study where still, as that shift happened in the US, around the world, people still didn't have access to IO in the front line. And so this is, you know, the way that the study went and, and the data, I think, does show that sort of the combination is more striking in the IO plus TT fields. However, as you look at the subset, the numbers are smaller. And so it's hard to make any meaningful conclusions of, you know, would a patient with docetaxel not benefit with the addition of TT fields? We saw numerical improvement in survival. We saw preclinical data showing benefits in ta with the taxanes. It, meet, it met the primary endpoint in the ITT population. So I think, you know, further studies are needed, but I don't conclude that you can't use it with docetaxel, but you definitely can see that the benefit seems greater in the TT fields plus IO. So Jacob, thoughts or questions? Well, I guess the question then, Tiziana, is this something that you'd consider incorporating? Uh, where would you incorporate it? Um, what, how, how, how convinced are you from, from the results from this one study? Yeah, I mean, I, I definitely think the frontline studies and the chemo rads, um, post chemo rad studies are much needed and much awaited. They're actually already ongoing. If this gets approved by the FDA in clinical practice, where I would see myself considering the use would be in those patients that received prior IO, that were IO sensitive, that I'm now thinking about, do I rechallenge with IO? Do I go to docetaxel? Do I think of another strategy? I think in that IO rechallenge sensitive population, I definitely would consider using tumor treating fields plus IO because I think there's a lot less toxicities. Obviously, you know, cross trial comparisons of other studies. And I would consider it with docetaxel. You know, when we look at the overall survival results here with TT fields plus docetaxel, I think it compares favorably with docetaxel plus RAM and the toxicities are much less. So I would consider in those two settings, um, I think we need more data and I think the data will come and hopefully we'll see that this will pan out, you know, in the front line as well. Karen, any thoughts or questions? I was just flashing on maybe uh, we'll be doing uh, Pembro, Ramucirumab, tumor treating field someday, but <laughs> any thoughts or questions? I think that's an interesting concept and, and maybe possible. I think this, this tumor treating fields is possibly something you could add to multiple types of therapies. I think from this study, you know, as uh, Tiziana has given us the, the details, you know, many of these patients were never pretreated with um, ICI. So this is really not a subsequent therapy, but an initial ICI therapy. The other issue is that many of the patients, as she mentioned, didn't have um, PDL1 testing. So we don't know how many of these on each arm were high, and I think that's actually incredibly important when you're talking about untreated patients, um, patients who had never received prior ICI. So I think there are some questions um, into what's driving this efficacy, and, um, and, and so I, I, I'm not quite sure it's ready for prime time for everyone, but I think it's an interesting modality, and it, it may be a good adjuvant to lots of the types of therapies that we do. I'd just like to add, come to our presentation at WCLC. We do have some data on the PDL1 subgroups, right. the data that we have available. Right. So we'll be in Singapore presenting some of that data. Great. Right. I saw that. So uh, final uh, questions from Corey uh, or comments. Uh, I was talking about the incredible change in the oncology waiting rooms that happened about seven or eight years ago when I uh, checkpoint inhibitors come in. I kind of wonder, you know, 10 years from now, do you think we're going to look at our waiting rooms and see a bunch of people with these uh, uh, devices. Uh, any questions or thoughts, Corey? I think uh, technology is going to uh, hopefully uh, help us out here that uh, the devices will be less obtrusive, uh, less uh, labor intensive, uh, uh, less bulky. Uh, uh, folks that, uh, at least to the company that uh, manufactures this, I know are working on that. Um, this is unprecedented. I've never seen a device of this sort, of any sort really, alter uh, outcomes in metastatic setting. Certainly uh, 
uh, are in the locally advanced setting, our radiation oncologist has been playing with all sorts of devices, but not in this setting. Um, the criticism that it's only uh, appears to be working with ICIs, I think we have to take uh, uh, seriously. Um, the, the data with dose taxol alone obviously are a bit weaker, but remember that's just a subset analysis. These are relatively small numbers in that group. So the implications really are for frontline and for locally advanced where it may make the most sense. Patients completing chemo radiation, then going on to DERVA plus or minus TTF. Um, the disease is within the chest, presumably still within the chest and hasn't metastasized. So I wouldn't be surprised if we uh, realize even greater uh, benefits in that setting. And there will be studies. I think, Tiziana, you'll be reporting on um, the patterns of recurrence uh, infield versus uh, outfield versus, uh, uh, you know, uh, looking at bone or uh, extra thoracic metastases, whether they're major differences. And then also the duration of the treatment. In GBM, 75% uh, uh, time with these uh, uh, treatment arrays seems to be the sweet uh, spot. If you can hit that or higher, you have greater relative survival benefit. If you fall below 55 or 65 percent, that survival benefit has uh, been reduced. So that analysis, I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, Tiziana, will also be taking place. Yeah. And in GBM specifically, they used a threshold value of 50% or greater average monthly usage. And we'll be able to capture that because that's all in the device. So hopefully we'll have that data. And, you know, at this time, you know, we, we saw the median device usage, but um, I guess we'll have to see what the data shows if there is, like in GBM, that, you know, association between the monthly usage and outcomes. In GBM, it correlated with overall survival and PFS. So, uh, Corey, uh, Karen, Tiziana, and Jacob, thank you so much uh, for spending this time with us today. Uh, it was really exciting. There's so many interesting things going on right now. I'm really looking forward to see where this leads in the future. So, uh, this concludes our program. This has really been a great afternoon. Thank you so much.